afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and I'll call this meeting to order. I see that uh, all four board members are present. So at this time, I'll call on Susan Barrett for the Executive Director's Report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a few announcements for folks today. First, I wanted to start with several ongoing open special public comment periods we have. The first one, uh, which you're going to hear a lot more about today, is on the 2022 FY22 uh, Home Care Vermont. Oops, there's a little bit of an echo. So if you're not talking, you could put yourself on mute. Thank you. Uh, the FY22 budget and certification. So we're asking that folks share public comments by December 17th to be considered uh, before the potential vote from the board, which is tentatively scheduled for December 22nd. It is scheduled for December 22nd. Um, in addition, we are, the board is accepting public comments through December 13th on the proposed red line and request letter for the all pair model agreement, the proposal to request a one year extension of the current agreement. We would ask that you submit those comments, as I said to, uh, before, on, or at the end of the day, but on December 13th, for, so that the board can consider those comments before uh, the potential vote scheduled on December 15th. And separately, and not to be confused with the one-year extension proposal of the current agreement, is an ongoing special public comment period that we've been uh, we opened up back in February of this year, and this is for any comments regarding a potential next agreement between the state of Vermont and CMMI. And any of the comments we receive, we share with our colleagues at AHS and at the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations on a potential next agreement. I'd also want folks to just be aware that over the next few weeks, we have pretty busy schedules and important decisions that we'll be making. So I just want to take these off quickly. This is on our website under our public meeting portal. Um, first, next Wednesday, we'll hear from our staff on the 2022 Medicare benchmark proposal for the all pair model. We'll also have a, we also have a potential vote scheduled for the 2021 update to the Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan and 2022 Connectivity Criteria. And then we also have a potential vote scheduled for the all pair model agreement proposal to request a one-year extension of the current agreement. And then next Wednesday night, we have our primary care advisory group meeting from five to seven. And at that meeting, we're going to hear from Vermont Medical Society on their primary care platform for prioritization. Uh, the next week, uh, which is the 22nd of December, we have a potential vote scheduled for FY for the FY22 One Care Vermont budget. We have a potential vote scheduled for the uh, 2022 Medicare benchmark proposal for the all pair model. And then we've also put another placeholder of a potential vote for the all pair model agreement proposal to request a one year extension of the current agreement. So lots upcoming and going on, um, but I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, so that we can hear from our staff on their recommendations on the One Care Vermont budget. Thank you, Susan. Uh, the next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, December 1st. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, December 1st, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the minutes passed unanimously. At this point, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Sarah Kensler. And Sarah, if you could introduce um, the team and uh, we will proceed with the um, preliminary um, staff recommendations for the 2022 One Care Vermont budget and certification. So Sarah Kensler. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, can you all hear me OK? We can. Great. Um, for the record, this is Sarah Kinsler, GMCB's Director of Health Systems Policy. 
Uh, here with, with me presenting today are Marissa Melamed, Michelle Degree, Patrick Rooney, Russ McCracken, Michelle Sawyer, and Julia Bowles. Uh, and I believe uh, Michelle Sawyer is going to put our slides up um, to project while I get us started and kind of direct for the whole show. Thank you, Michelle. All right, um, so on slide two, we've included an acronym list up front just as a guide, uh, since we know that this can get pretty jargony pretty fast, but we've also tried to make sure that we introduce these terms when we first use them as well. Um, on the third slide, I'm just going to walk us through a quick agenda. Um, first, we'll provide a bit of introduction and background, uh, as well as reviewing the public comment that we've received to date. Then we will walk through the FY22 staff analysis and preliminary recommendations. And the text box here uh, on the bottom right shows you what those key areas of review are that we'll be diving more deeply into. Uh, and then we'll we'll talk about next steps, have um, you know board board questions and discussion, uh, and then public comment. And I'm going to hand it over to Marissa Melamed now on slide four. Marissa, I think you are muted. I apologize. Thank you. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this slide uh, you're seeing now should be familiar to all of you. Uh, just a reminder that oversight of accountable care organizations is falls under uh, statute in 18 BSA section 9382 and Green Mountain Care Board rule 5.0. Um, we are going to discuss uh, both certification and budget review today. Certification occurs one time following application um, for certification by an ACO and eligibility verification is performed annually. Um, but uh, there is no, if there are no um, changes um, to the, or enforcement of certification, then there's no board action that is required. Um, budget review works a little bit differently. It does have to be uh, voted on and approved annually. Um, and then a reminder that uh, we are still in uh, the season of contract negotiation. Uh, so budget review concur uh, occurs concurrently with the contract negotiation and these contracts are not currently finalized. So the numbers are prepared based on one cares um, best estimates um, as they currently see them. Um, and once contracts are finalized, we have them come back in the spring with updated numbers uh, to present a finalized budget. So it is really a two part process. I also want to make a note that for this review, uh, the Greenmount Care Board has brought together an inter interdisciplinary staff team. Um, it consists of our uh, policy team, which looks at payment um, and care models and intersection with the all payer model our finance team, which does the financial analysis and intersection with hospital regulation. Our data team reviews results, evaluation, uh, and looks at all uh, data systems and, and data issues. And then we have our legal team, which looks at compliance with statute and rule. We can move on to slide five, which is just a reminder of the timeline. Um, so the green line there is today. It's our staff presentation. Um, there's a number of steps still to go in the process. Today is just your first look at our, our preliminary recommend, rec recommendations. Excuse me. Um, a vote needs to happen by the end of the year, but it is tentatively planned for December 22nd. If there are any issues after today that need to come back before the board, we can um, do that at regularly scheduled board meetings or schedule meetings as needed to make sure that we can resolve issues in time for a vote. Uh, the Medicare benchmark and the Medicaid advisory rate case are separate from today's conversation, um, though they do happen concurrently in December. So it's a very busy month. Um, and that, as uh, Susan mentioned, is on the schedule for um, the 22nd, I believe. <clears throat> Uh, the, so the vote happens by the end of the year. The Green Mountain Care Board issues a budget order, um, usually uh, you know, in late January, maybe first thing in February. 
Uh, the final contracts and final budget is reviewed in the spring. Um, we also develop guidance and any benchmarks for the 23 budget in the spring, and we monitor One Care's actuals and performance against the budget and conditions ongoing. I think it's been said many times now, but uh, public comment is accepted throughout the process um, and uh, should be submitted by December 17th so that we have time to review it in time for um, subsequent discussions or deliberation. And now I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Julia, for an overview of public comment to date. Perfect. Thank you, Marissa. And can I just get a nod that folks can hear me? We can. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so as Marissa said, the next two slides give a summary of the major themes of the public comments we received this year. In total, as of yesterday, December 7th, we had received 43 comments. Um, and I want to note that the themes on the slide here, as well as questions and comments that were raised um, sort of outside of what's reflected on this slide, are addressed in detail throughout the presentation. So I'm just sort of giving that summary, but um, for folks who, who commented, you know, expect to see those themes reflected later. Um, so four of the central themes that we wanted to highlight from the public comments were first, the value of OneCare's data and analytics to providers, especially for population level insights and prevention initiatives. Second, the value of care coordination investments that are enabled by OneCare funding. Third, concerns related to the decrease in population health management and mission-related investments. And fourth, concerns related to OneCare's leadership compensation. Um, so the next slide summarizes specifically public comment from the healthcare advocate. And, um, okay, I'm sorry, just took a second to change on my end. Um, and so as a reminder, the healthcare advocate under the ACO oversight statute has the right to ask questions, receive confidential materials, and provide testimony in any ACO budget hearings, which is why we wanted to specifically highlight their comments through its own slide. Um, and we also want to extend a special thank you to the HCA for their thoughtful engagement throughout this entire process. So as you can see on the slide, the HCA provided comments on four major categories, which were population health, transparency, evaluation, and cost estimation for Vermonters, um, all of which you know, are covered in future slides. So as Marissa already said, but as I will remind folks, and as Susan already said, um, we are still open to receiving public comment, we just ask that you get it to us by December 17th, so it can be considered ahead of the board's vote. And with that, I will pass it back to Marissa. Thank you, Julia. I think Julia and I are gonna um, go back and forth a little bit because she's going to help me with this high level staff analysis, but I just wanted to say um, a quick word here. You can go, uh, to Michelle, to the next slide. Um, this is what we're going to do now is a high level overview of the budget submission and our approach to the review and the staff recommendations this year. Um, these are the, the major sections that we're going to talk about in the high level overview, the provider network, the payer programs, the income statement. Um, these three things are um, summary, summary information that's pulled directly from the budget submission, things that we thought would help sort of ground the conversation. Um, we're also going to say a word about the impact of COVID-19 and then our approach to the recommendations this year. Um, a, a note that I wanted to make here um, before we proceed is that we review a uh, high volume of material. Um, obviously, you can see this is a, um, a large slide deck um, and it's uh, because it's our sort of step-by-step -step review of all the different sections. Um, but the amount of material we review consists of, I think it's 129 pages of um, budget narrative, um, two rounds of questions, um, of which are dozens of pages, as well as um, reporting that comes in continuously throughout the year. So it's, it's a high volume of material, um, which is why there are there's so much information, um, and we do our best to boil it down to the categories that um, are um, uh, most important to understanding the budget um, and also significant changes that we've noted from, from year to year. So um, we hope that we have been able to take the uh, large volume of material and um, present it to you uh, in a in a clear a clear way to help with your decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe, yeah, the next slide goes to Julia to give us some of that high level information. 
slide. Yes, thank you. So, um, yeah, so starting with the high level overview, we wanted to give just a very, very high level picture of the provider network this year. And um, all this information, as Marissa said, is pulled from the submission. In this one in particular, this information is easily found in the budget narrative. And overall, the changes in the provider network are minimal this year and were typically due to mergers, acquisitions, and retirements. And in summary, as, as you can see on the slide, there were no changes in the number of hospitals or federally qualified health centers participating in the network from fiscal year 21 to 22. And of note in this third bullet is the addition of two independent primary care practices who have opted back into the comprehensive payment reform program for 2022. And more information on the provider network is found at the end of this deck in the reference slides, as well as again in the budget narrative. And finally on this slide, I want to highlight that approximately 90% of Vermont primary care providers participate in OneCare's network. And this is according to estimates derived from the Vermont Department of Health's workforce survey data. So we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So um, transitioning to payer programs, again, we thought it would just be really helpful to give a high level overview of the payer programs, the participation by HSA and the anticipated scale for fiscal year 22. Um, so this slide is really intended to show the scope of programs in, in terms of those categories. And as you can see, there's four payer programs or there's four payers, excuse me, with five payer programs noting that the Blue Cross Blue Shield primary non-risk group does not meet the criteria for scale as reflected um, in, in the third column of this slide. So that's something that will be covered in more detail in the scale section of this presentation. Um, and as shown by the middle column, there's varying participation by HSA depending on the payer program with Medicaid being the largest program, both by HSA and, and scale as a result. And we can head to the next slide, please. Perfect. So um, finally, for my my section of the high level overview, we wanted to again just give a very, very high picture summary of the income statements. So this is showing two different pieces of one cares budget, the top being the full accountability budget and the bottom chart showing the entity level. So as you can see, one cares fiscal year 22 full accountability budget proposes $1.365 billion in revenue and matching expenditures, which results in a break-even net income. And the bottom chart, which is specific to OneCare's fiscal year 22 entity level or GAAP budget, um, they're proposing $27.3 million in revenues and matching expenditures, resulting in a break-even net income. And this is something that Patrick will go into much more detail on in the financial section. So with that, I will pass it, I believe, to Sarah. Thank you, Julia. Um, so before we dive into the details, we do want to specifically um, and explicitly acknowledge the impact of COVID-19 on Vermont's healthcare system generally and on Vermont's efforts to transition to value-based payment more specifically. Um, COVID has created unique uncertainty for providers, ACOs, and payers in designing and implementing value-based models, and that includes volatile utilization patterns, impacts on quality measurement, um, linking results to performance or challenges linking results to performance, uh, as well as financial uncertainty. Um, the, and I want to emphasize minimal, um, silver lining here is that COVID-19 has really laid bare the challenges of fee-for-service payment in, in this kind of environment and shown us that fixed payments can be a critical tool for stabilizing healthcare providers uh, in times of great uncertainty. Um, next slide, please, Michelle. Thank you. Um, so we're going to close this high level overview by sharing a bit about our team's approach to this year's review and the recommendations. Um, you'll notice that the preliminary recommendations have an overall focus on data driven monitoring and oversight, and that includes a focus on ensuring that the ACO's management drives continuous improvement consi consistent with the high performing ACO and that it supports achieving the state's health reform goals. Um, we have shifted away this year from recommendations that are more managerial, managerial in nature. And our hope is that by taking a more data-driven approach, we can both reduce the regulatory burden uh, on regulated entities and move the board's focus away from granular line items um, in the budget and instead to a focus um, that is more intently looking at one care's results. Next slide, please. So what does this actually mean? Um, our, our core recommendation is to require OneCare to measure its performance against peer ACOs and to report this to the board. 
Um, this both gives the board valuable information about how OneCare's results compare to similar organizations, um, and it gives OneCare an important management tool uh, and the opportunity to target their efforts um, to areas where um, data shows that there can be room for improvement. Um, it also allows them to learn from high performers and implement best practices in these areas since they'll have kind of a national peer group. Um, it will also show us where uh, OneCare might already be best in class, which is important information to know. Um, all of this would be reflected in an updated ACO reporting manual and in the FY23 budget guidance, um, which would allow us to kind of um, institute more, more set benchmarks. So now we are going to move into the key areas of review for FY22, um, and I'm going to be handing it off to staff um, to dig into those key areas, um, but I will just list them for you before we get started so folks have an idea of where we are going. Um, the key areas of review where we'll be uh, digging more deeply uh, in this presentation are ACO certification, FY22 budget and financials, total cost of care and trend rates, payer programs, risk model and settlement, payment models and fixed perspective payments, population health quality and model of care, and results to date. Uh, and the results to date section includes uh, the federal all-payer model evaluation, all-payer model scale, FY20 payer program results, and a recent analysis by Green Mountain Care Board uh, analytics contractor, mathematical policy research. Next up is Michelle Sawyer. Thank you, Sarah. All right, so as previously mentioned, certification is a part of the ACO oversight process um, overseen by the Green Mountain Care Board. Every year we verify one care's eligibility to maintain their certification. Today, uh, we will cover some highlights from the fiscal year 22 certification process. Um, there is a deeper dive on each section of the certification requirements in the reference slides, and there will be additional information in the memo that will be released at the completion of our certification verification process. So earlier in 2021, uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock Health withdrew their membership interest, leaving UVM Medical Center as the sole member. This membership was then transferred to UVM Health Network. When this change occurred, the eighth operating agreement was updated. The ninth operating agreement's primary updates include adjustments from having two member organizations to a single member organization. Um, this reflected uh, or this affected how the board of managers is composed, um, how the board handles disputed matters, um, and selection of the chair of the board of managers was also updated. Uh, with respect to One Care's governance, One Care Vermont is a manager managed LLC, which means that it is run by its board of managers and not its member. The member's role in the governance of One Care is exercised through the member's appointment of three of the managers, which is why we focus on the changes to the composition and structure of the board of managers that resulted from UVM Health Network becoming the sole member. Uh, the member's direct involvement is limited to the right to approve a sale, merger, consolidation, or liquidation of OneCare, the admission of another member, or changes to OneCare's articles of organization or operating agreement. We also note that UVM Medical Center provides administrative support to OneCare, which is not new, um, and, but was also the case prior to UVM uh, Health Network becoming OneCare's sole member. OneCare employees are UVM employees and are cover, uh, covered under UVM's uh, insurance and benefits plan. UVM provides payroll and accounts payable processing and other administrative services to OneCare. And OneCare pays UVM an administrative expense reimbursement. These related party transactions are reported in OneCare's audited financial statements. So previously, uh, each member held three appointed seats on the Board of Managers. The three seats previously appointed by Dartmouth-Hitchcock are now redistributed in the following categories. We have one seat for an at-large member, one for an academic medical center in New Hampshire serving Vermonters, and one for an academic medical center in Vermont serving Vermonters. As the sole member organization, UVM Health Network may appoint three seats. Um, it is worth noting that the three seats previously held by Dartmouth-Hitchcock must be nominated and voted on by the board, while the UVM Health Network seats only need appointment by UVM Health Network. Um, also worth noting, the 
uh, current chair, John Brumstead, is uh, stepping down and leaving the Board of Managers in January of 2022. Uh, Teresa Fama of Central Vermont Medical Center Rheumatology will replace Dr. Brumstead as uh, a member of the board. And the new board chair will be selected in January of 2022 and will be one of the three seats appointed by UVM Health Network. Um, our legal team has reviewed the change to the membership and the changes in the operating agreement related to the governance of the ACO and determined that these changes do not violate certification requirements of 18 VSA section 9382A or Green Mountain Care Board Rule 5.2. If there are any additional questions about this topic, legal is available to provide information on their analysis. So regarding executive compensation, um, in May of this year, the board issued guidance regarding executive compensation. The guidance issued by the board under Rule 5 is a requirement that one care must satisfy to maintain their certification. In order to maintain certification, an ACO must structure its executive compensation to achieve specific and measurable goals that support the ACO's efforts to reduce cost growth or improve the quality and overall care of enrollees or both. Last year during the certification process, we asked One Care about how executive compensation is determined. They, so they shared uh, that they target the market median for base pay and the 65th percentile for total direct compensation uh, through the use of a third party consultant. Staff are gathering information to confirm One Care's uh, compliance with the executive compensation guidance separate from this ACO budget and certification process. As part of the fiscal year 22 certification process, the staff have a few remaining questions for One Care uh, in the following categories population health management and care coordination, performance evaluation and improvement executive compensation, uh, and updated and new policies and documents. Uh, the staff will be sending these requests for additional information to OneCare in the near future. The board does not need to take any action regarding certification eligibility at this time. As in prior years, the staff will be preparing a memo regarding certification eligibility verification for fiscal year 22. Uh, next will be um, a review of the ACO budget and financials with Patrick Rooney. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, if you could advance the slide, please. <clears throat> Great, thank you. So we have uh, two separate uh, versions this year that we're going to walk through here in this review. Uh, the first one is One Care's full account accountability non-GAAP budget that Julia spoke of earlier. Uh, and for those who aren't familiar with this terminology, <clears throat> uh, this is kind of their all-in financial perspective. It captures their expected uh, total cost of care pass-through, contract revenues, including fixed perspective payment, and organizational revenues and expenses derived from operations. Uh, the full budget accountability budget is not in line with US generally accepted accounting principles as most of the revenues, mainly around expected total cost of care, fixed perspective payment are the responsibility of third party fiduciaries. So one care when it comes down to it as an organization um, does not claim those revenues as their own as an entity. Um, because of that, we wanted to get a different perspective coming into this year to look at kind of the nuts and bolts of One Care, and that's the entity level. Oh, come on. Okay, I'm back. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, and that's the entity level look that uh, strips away all of these uh, accountability or responsibility components of their budget and just looks at one care of the organization. And when one care is audited, it's done at this level. And that is to take a look at how one care uh, derives its revenue and incurs its expenses to facilitate that larger $1.365 billion budget. We do have an asterisk here that does note that in the November presentation, uh, one care uh, brought about a narrative around a budget of $44.2 million. Uh, so this is a separate narrative that 
one care uses because it's how they see themselves uh, but it's not part of the guidance that we provided or the review you'll have here today and the board here will ultimately make its decision on that full accountability version but we wanted to clarify what the 44.2 million dollar budget that they presented is and it's an amalgamation of the entity level budget plus the medicaid next gen added total cost to care <clears throat> confidential contract revenues as well as full responsibility for Medicaid admin, traditional and expanded revenues. Now that last piece, the full responsibility, there is a component of that that passes through to that gap version, but it does not pass through on a dollar for dollar basis. So um, the 44.2 million is really a combination of several factors there. And they're offset by population health and payment reform program and operating expenditures on the other side of the uh, income statement. Next slide, please. Thank you. So here we have the summary income statement, full accountability dating back to 2018 to show you the progression uh, in one care as it has come off from kind of its infancy <clears throat> into a more mature uh, organization here as we move from 2021 into 2022. This slide is updated with 2021 projections that we received in their third quarter reporting last week. Uh, and there's an asterisk there for the reason that this does include the reporting of about $14.1 million in settlement revenue and $9.6 million in settlement expense. There is on slide 129 a variance table that shows where, compared to their revised budget, their projection is expected to come in. They are missing their budget uh, slightly, except for the areas of other revenues, including settlement and population health management, including settlement, which is where the accounting for that $14.1 million in revenue and $9.6 million in expense is being accounted for. So they are overachieving their budget in those two areas. Also, as you can see, uh, the projection, the ex expectation moving through the fourth fiscal quarter and last quarter of this calendar year is that one care is anticipating a $2.4 million uh, operating surplus uh, to round out the 2021 fiscal year. Uh, it's important to note in the 2020 column under net income, there is a zero there. This is a topic that will reemerge throughout this presentation today. Uh, they did generate a break even budget for 2020 uh, this is due to uh, an action taken by One Care Vermont's Board of Managers to refund the risk-bearing entities of the hospitals uh, in the amount aggregated at $3.1 million. Um, that otherwise would have been their operating surplus for 2020 <clears throat> fiscal year. Um, but if you go to slide 130 as a reference, you can see how that uh, refund was distributed amongst the 14 entities. 13 here in Vermont and one in New Hampshire. And we have a breakout uh, by that as submitted by One Care Vermont. The 2022 budget, as was noted earlier by Julia, um, is proposed at 1.365 billion. This is a 10.3% increase over the 21 revised budget, 12% over the 21 projection as submitted last week. Um, the major drivers here are increases in total cost of care, fixed respective payment and participation fees, on the expense side, One Care is also budgeting 1.365, which will result in a break even budget. Major drivers on that side of the equation are total cost of care spend and FPP spend increases. <clears throat> um, administration ratios, uh, which has been a metric throughout this process over the years, continues to drop as that is weighted against the totality of revenues. So as those revenues grow exponentially, if the operating costs grow much slower than that because they were a smaller portion of the total, that number will continue to drop. Next slide, please. So as we move through this, we're going to provide a couple of different perspectives here, kind of the traditional uh, numbers table and also an illustration for those folks following at home who are um, more illustratively inclined. Um, I can understand that. But what you can see here is a, a chronological financial sequence from 2019 through the proposed 2022 budget of these uh, high level revenue components of one care. And you can see that expected total cost of care revenue uh, 
in 2019 was about 43% of total revenues. That's grown to 65% as proposed in this fiscal year. Uh, overall, the 884, should it come to fruition in 2022, represents a 200% increase over 2019's actual expected total cost of care revenues. <clears throat> uh, it's important to remember that although one care is accountable for the expected total cost of care revenue and spend, they do not um, expend any human or financial capital in processing those claims, uh, but they are accountable for that through their risk arrangements that they have set forth <clears throat> and the metrics that will determine the outcome of that. Um, contract revenues have declined as a percentage of total. Uh, however, those are primarily driven by fixed perspective payments and fixed perspective payments in 2022 um, account for about 446 million of that 453.2. Uh, fixed perspective payments uh, in 2022, again, should that come to fruition, represents a 29% increase over um, 2019, just in the fixed perspective payments category. So there is growth in dollars happening under that line item. Uh, participation fees are also looking to increase up to 19.2 million. Uh, quarter three projections that were supplied to us show participation fees falling about $2.3 million short of that $18.9 million figure you see in the FY21 budget with the date of May 24th. So they are looking to increase that. <clears throat> and as we go back to 20, as we spoke about the refund, you can see participation fees at their lowest point on this table. And the graph to the right will show you the visually the concentrations of the different revenue components that comprise uh, the financial activity over the years, including the 1.365 billion that is proposed for 2022. Next slide, please, Michelle. <clears throat> this is the other side of the full accountability income statement. You can see here that expenses total 1.365, which results in that break even budget. Uh, the primary drivers, this largely reflects the revenue activity on the other side, uh, with the total cost of care healthcare spend growing at a relative amount, rising to $875.3 million. And there's that fixed perspective payment spend uh, at $445.9 million, <clears throat> uh, almost a dollar for dollar uh, offset to the revenue growth in that component. Uh, one piece here. Uh, that I'd like to draw your attention to as it will come up as we navigate through this presentation is population health management expenses. Those are at their lowest point uh, on this time frame and their lowest point since uh, 2018 as a in terms of dollars and in terms of percentage of the total. Um, <clears throat> operating expenses at the very bottom here on slide 26, uh, you can see are being funded at levels relative to fiscal year 19. And we'll talk a little bit more about how one care arrived at that $15.3 million as proposed for budget year 2022. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so for board members, this is a perspective that you'll remember from the hospital budget process for folks who follow exclusively the ACO process. We have not utilized this look yet. Um, this is an effort to illustrate and inform the folks at home of some of the major uh, growth contributors or reductive components of a of the uh, upcoming budget. And what we're doing here is we're reconciling or bridging one budget year to the next. So we start off on on the left hand side there in fiscal year 21 revised budget, which is 1.23 billion for the full accountability. And what are the major components in this category being revenues uh, that are going to get that budget to its proposed 1.365 billion dollar uh, level that one care has brought before this board <clears throat> for fiscal year 22. Uh, and you can see here that primarily it's a $35 million increase in contract revenues and $91.4 million increase in expected total cost of care. Uh, the contract revenue category is driven by the increase in fixed perspective payments moving into fiscal year 22. Um, <clears throat> and that is it for that slide. Next slide, please, Michelle. Thank you. <clears throat> now we move to the expense categories and we've broken this down into some of the high level expense categories, total cost of care, PHM and operating expenses. 
this being the expected total cost of care spend moving into 2022, we can see a reductive component to uh, the Medicare modified next generation basic of 11.6 million, and then contributing factors uh, to that new FY22 budget for this category, uh, bringing it up to the 875.3. Uh, and the major drivers being a $16.1 million increase to the MVP program, uh, $36.9 million to Blue Cross Blue Shield primary risk, and $46.7 million increase to Blue Cross Blue Shield QHP program spend. Next slide, please. So this one has a little bit more detail. There were a few more categories, uh, all of them important, so we wanted to get it on here. Um, this graph is predominantly um, taken over by the increase in spend of the fixed perspective payments. So <clears throat> there are some uh, uh, some important factors here that you'll see largely around these reductive components coming out of the 2022 revised budget on the left. There are several categories here where spending is being scaled back across population health programs, value-based incentive fund being the largest, uh, moving left to right across several primary care uh, pr uh, provider and primary care prevention activities, as well as the innovation fund and longitudinal care. And then on the right hand side, we have that uh, lump fixed perspective payment increase of 38.6. So these graphs are very helpful in that uh, ordinarily, if you're just looking at a variance from year to year, you're going to see a big increase. But by breaking it down visually here, you can see that um, there is some scaling back of spending in those population health programs by line item. Uh, and ultimately, the budget for this category increases up to $475 million for fiscal year 22. Next slide, please. So rounding out the full accountability component of this review, we have the operating expenses. Um, as you can see, this is the software and IT, salaries and benefits, consulting and travel supplies and other. This category is dropping. This category also uh, does comply with generally accepted accounting principles. So you're gonna see this slide again when we go through the uh, entity level version, uh, but for purposes of consistency, we applied it twice. Uh, but you'll see that overall from 21 to 22, this budget is coming down about $600,000. And <clears throat> the um, primary reasons for that is the software IT uh, piece of this at 1.1 million. Uh, there's some activity there related to reclassification of expenses uh, and reductions to uh, vital dollars and health catalyst that make up the majority of that reduction. Um, as you can see, the net result of salaries is that they're essentially being level funded with 2019. So there's about a $5,000 variance there, not much movement, uh, but ultimately the budget for operating expenses ends at 5.3 million as proposed by OneCare. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so now we move into this new perspective, the entity level or uh, generally accepted accounting principles based uh, budgeting here. Um, and you can see that uh, when you strip away uh, the uh, accountability that OneCare has, it really boils it down to OneCare, the organization. What drives that $1.36 billion is this right here. Uh, these are revenues derived from operations expenses incurred. Uh, and the programs that OneCare facilitates uh, from their office. And you can see here that the 2022 budget um, is being proposed at 27.3 million <clears throat> for revenues and the same for operating expenses, which again results in a break even budget as proposed. Uh, on the revenue side, it's largely being uh, reduced from its uh, 2021 approved budget of 30.2 million due to the loss of HIT and DSR funding, totaling about $3.9 million. And that you can see is occurring in that other contract revenue uh, line item coming from 7.25 down to 3.36. Uh, and then there's some offset there with participation and fees growing by uh, about a half million dollars from budget to budget. Uh, population health is coming down a couple of million dollars here, uh, and then operating expenses about uh, 600,000. So all told, it it comes down <clears throat> just about the amount of that, just about the amount of that FY21 value of HIT and DSR funding. Next slide, please. 
So a similar look to the full accountability to keep it consistent here, showing this uh, chronological financial progression over the years. Um, you can see in 2019, their entity level budget was much, much larger than it is now. Um, you can also see the progression down of contract revenues as those have been uh, whittled away from almost a $12 million or $11 million high in 2020 down to the 3.4 that we uh, are looking at now. Participation fees are on the rebound from the low of 2020, but still not as high as 2021. But they do make up the largest portion of this operating entity's uh, revenues. So they are an integral part of, of <clears throat> what keeps one care the entity moving forward. And then we do have an increase in administrative revenues related to that uh, Medicare and Medicaid administrative revenues that do transfer through to this gap version of the budget. There's been increased activity there, both in the uh, full accountability and then in this gap version as well. And those continue to grow year over year. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Here's the expense side of the equation. Uh, you can see that operating expenses make up the bulk um, and then uh, PHM uh, takes up the remainder of that. So the illustrated chart to the right is not very diverse. These are the two major components of that entity level budget. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, population health and operating expenses on the next couple of slides. Next slide, please. So here's the revenue reconciliation at the entity level. We can see that contract revenue piece is discussed as coming down in a significant manner, which is you know, overall suppressing uh, the budget down to uh, 27.3. The bulk of that is related to that DSR and HIT funding. And then we have those uh, incremental components that are, are adding some back to that potential, but overall the budget potential still comes down to 27.3 but that's that administrative participation fees and other revenues that are increasing over budget for 2021. Next slide, please. Here's a little clearer view of the rollback of spending on the population health side. Uh, you can see more clearly here um, the fact that the fixed perspective payment is not involved in this perspective. Uh, the drivers that are reducing population health uh, for programs for one care, the entity, uh, that budget is coming down <clears throat> to about $12 million. Um, that essentially uh, brings them in line with um, pre-2019 levels of investment in that area. Um, so that is going to continue to permeate throughout this presentation, the discussion around uh, population health management and payment reform expenses. Next slide, please. Here's a familiar look, so I won't walk you through it again. Uh, these are the operating expenses and the activity that's occurring within that uh, line item and its subcategories there, um, with obviously a productive component of about $600,000 being the net net between the two budgets. Next slide. A little bit more focus on the entity level total operating expenses. So each one of these categories, you can see the fiscal year on the left and the vertical axes, these all add up to 100%. So in fiscal year 2021, their operating expenses were $15.9 million. So the weights of each one of these categories are applied to the whole. And in 2022, it's $15.3 million. And so the weights are appropriated in a similar fashion. So even though salaries are being level funded, the cuts that are occurring in that software and IT and the reclassification to of some of that money to travel supplies and other is shifting the weights there. Um, salaries, if we can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> A different perspective are being level funded. We can see the growth potential that's occurring there over the years up until 2021. Um, I do not believe they're going to hit the figures in their projection of that 15.9 million, uh, but as far as comparing budget to budget, salaries are being level funded. And this table here shows you some of the history and the impact of the reclassification that they've uh, adjusted for this, this coming budget. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna move through a few slides of recommendations uh, for your notes for <coughs> uh, discussion in the coming weeks. 
So the first recommendation here on the budget and financials is that one care is to notify the Green Mountain Care Board of any material changes to budget as approved by the one care board of managers, finance committee or leadership. Include the line item change, the dollar value and the impact of the bottom line as part of quarterly financial reporting according to specifications to be issued in the updated ACO reporting manual. And then there's a staff follow up there. We really wanted to see this uh, because in some of the responses we got, there are certain criteria that allow the board of managers to adjust the uh, internal budget of one care, which means they are expecting a variance either plus or minus. And we feel that it's more efficient to have one care disclose this to us on a quarterly basis than have to try to recap some of that information looking back over almost a full year of uh, activity for that organization. So this is an effort to keep transparency going in uh, uh, smaller bites, so to speak, throughout the year, rather than to have to try to recap variances looking back in um, September, October, or even now uh, in November and December <clears throat> over a year's worth of activity, which can jog the memory a little bit. So we were looking to add that to uh, the reporting manual. Next slide, please. The next recommendation is that no later than March 31st of 2022, OneCare will provide GMCB staff with the supporting documentation relevant to the topics identified and the condition to be determined. Among the supporting documentation, OneCare must submit final payer contracts, attribution by payer, a revised budget using template provided by the staff, final descriptions of OneCare's population health initiatives, hospital dues for 2022 by hospital, hospital risk for 2022 by hospital and payer, documentation of any changes to overall risk model in 2022, source of funds for its 2022 population health management programs, update of pr on purchase of approved Medicare benchmarking system for use in 2022, proposed options for benchmarking for Medicaid and commercial payer programs for use in 2023, and any other information GMCB deems relevant to insurance, ensuring compliance with this order. Next slide, please, Michelle. The next recommendation is that at its presentation of the revised budget and no later than April 30th of 2022, One Care must present to the Green Mountain Care Board on the following topics, final 2022 attribution and finalized payer contracts, revised budget based on final attribution, final description of population health initiatives, expected hospital dues for 2022 by hospital, expected risk for 2022 by risk bearing entity and payer, any changes to the overall risk model for 2022, source of sources of funds for One Care's population management health programs, in 2022 and any other information GMCB deems relevant to ensuring compliance with this order. Next slide, please. The next recommendation in 2022, OneCare's operating expenses must not exceed 15.3 million as budgeted and discussed uh, in this review, plus the cost of the benchmarking system to be purchased as acquired in a condition to be determined following approval by the board staff. If the board requires changes to the total amount of one care's value based incentive fund, one care may adjust total allowable operating expenses commensurate with such required changes. Next slide, please. In this recommendation, <laughs> if one care uses its reserve, adjusts its participation fees, i.e., invoicing risk bearing entity for additional fees or refunding fees, or uses its line of credit, it must notify the Green Mountain Care Board within 15 days of such use. Notification must include the reason for the change for any use authorized under this condition, a corresponding cash flow analysis. For refunded participation fees, one care must provide the date of the board of manager decision and documentation of the amounts refunded to each risk bearing entity. Uh, subpart A, the use of reserves, additional participation fees or funds drawn from one care's line of credit shall be limited to additional funding for population health investments, financial backing for risk incurred by participating providers, maintaining ACO wide risk on behalf of participating providers, temporary cash flow issues associated with payer revenue delays and other uses pre-approved by the Green Mountain Care Board. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and the last recommendation, one care must submit its audited financial statements as soon as they are available and must submit information as required by the GMCB to monitor one care's performance. One care must crosswalk submitted actuals per its budget submission to audited financial statements for fiscal 2018 to 2022. The bulk of that has been done in this past year. <clears throat> and the recommendation of one care to provide Green Mountain Care Board its most recent version of the ACO's IRS Form 990 as soon as it is available. Uh, one care is new to the nonprofit world, but they are working on finalizing their 990. Um, so once that is available, uh, we are looking to make that a recommendation of uh, and deliverable by one care to Green Mountain Care Board.
And with that, I will turn it back over to Marissa. Thank you so much, Patrick. I am now going to talk briefly about total cost of care and trend rates in OneCare's budget. Uh, this includes projected FY22 total cost of care by payer and budgeted specific, sorry, budgeted payer specific trend rates. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is the topic of other uh, board, board meetings in December. So I'm not going to get into the details today, but want to introduce the topic. You can go to slide 46, please. So this table is a representation of what is in the uh, budget submission. Um, we have uh, FY21 projected total cost of care as uh, recently received in Q3 financial reporting, expected uh, budgeted total cost of care for FY22, that's full accountability, um, and the budgeted trend rates um, from the base experience as presented in Appendix 4.3 of the budget submission. Um, that is Medicare at 10.6%. Uh, that's based on the um, uh, Medicare uh, call letter that we receive. And again, Sarah Lindbergh will go into this in more detail next week. Um, Medicaid, uh, traditional at 2.1%. Medicaid uh, expanded at 0.7% and the uh, commercial trend rates are for the budget year are uh, confidential at this time. Um, there's a note here to remind you that the base year varies by program. The budgeted trend rate does not represent FY21 to 22 growth. And the expected total cost of care for Blue Cross Blue Shield primary is the risk lines, the risk lies only not the uh, non-risk or, or non-scale target qualifying. Next slide, please. So again, um, getting into greater details, not part of today's discussion, but I wanted to note a couple of key uh, points here that setting the financial targets remains challenging due to the ongoing pandemic um, and that staff will discuss the implication of the trend rate, particularly the Medicare trend um, for all payer model agreement total cost of care at the December 15th presentation and make staff recommendations um, which I believe is also scheduled for the 22nd. And you can go to slide 48, which is our recommendation on this section. And this is uh, same recommendation or same condition we have used in the past, um, which is that one care must ensure that its payer contracts are consistent with the following 2022 benchmark trend rates and related conditions. So for Vermont Medicare ACO initiative, it's the trend factors proposed by the GMCB and approved by CMS um, that is um, happening shortly. For Medicaid Next Generation ACO program, it's the trend factors that are consistent with the um, uh, approved Medicaid rate and the GMCB's recommendation in the Medicaid advisory rate case. And then for the commercial program, the benchmark trend rates for commercial programs must be consistent with the ACO attributed population and the GMCB approved rate filings. Um, and also to help uh, verify these trends, one care must provide the GMCB with actuarial certification for each of its commercial benchmarks. Um, and an explanation of how its overall rate of growth across all pairs fits with the overall APM target rate of growth. And if its overall rate of growth exceeds the APM target, how it plans to achieve the target for the term of the APM agreement. And then they submit a revised budget based on the finalized benchmarks um, in the spring. So this uh, recommendation or sorry, condition has not changed um, since last year. And Sarah Kinsler is going to continue with payer programs and risk model. Thank you, Marissa. Um, now we're going to we're going to dive a little bit deeper um, on payer programs and the risk model. Um, we know that this was an area of significant interest in last year's process, and so we hope that this year we can um, you know give give a little bit more information and analysis. Um, I'll be giving a summary of the risk models in each program, talking about total risk um, by health service area and how the primary care about accountability pool fits into that risk, um, and giving a summary of the policies related to distributing shared savings or shared losses that one care maintains. <clears throat> so on slide 50, um, we've included just a bit of background to level set. Um, so one care assumes risk from payers, uh, and then it designs and implements the methodology for spreading that risk out to the provider network. 
Um, this is documented in one care's policies uh, and its agreements with providers, but we, we kind of wanted to separate those two concepts and we'll talk about them a little bit separately. Um, so slide 51. Uh, it's just a brief disclaimer. Um, this analysis is based on the budget submission only because the contracts are still in process. Um, Medicare and Medicaid contracts are finalized by the end of December and are required to be in effect for January 1st. Um, whereas on the commercial side, uh, the contracts are often not finalized until um, after the start of the performance year and are presented in their revised budget submission and presentation. On slide 52, um, this slide covers the first aspect of that background slide. Um, so this is the risk that one care assumes from payers. And I won't read this slide to you in detail, um, just to note that it reviews key aspects of each payer program, including core payment models, budgeted risk corridor, uh, noting that uh, that information is confidential and redacted for commercial programs uh, and, the, and the link to quality. Um, I'll note that the, the submission is not particularly detailed about the link to quality at this time. Uh, these statements come from the submission and we expect to receive more information on, in our review of the finalized contracts. So um, before we move on, I'll speak to the, to the risk corridor column, um, just to note that these risk corridors are fairly consistent with um, FY21, but that that is um, a pretty steep drop from earlier years of our review. Um, for example, in 2019, the board's order set maximum risk limits at 5% for Medicare, 4% for Medicaid, 3% for commercial, and 1.8% for self-funded. Um, and obviously, uh, COVID has significantly impacted um, those risk corridors, but that's just something that we wanted to highlight. Um, moving on to the next slide, I'm going to shift to talking about how OneCare then distributes that risk to its network. Um, this slide and the following slide cover key OneCare policies. Um, so the, the program settlement policy here um, describes the uh, $1.50 per member per month payment, or uh, excuse me, uh, first dollar kind of risk and potential for savings um, for primary care practices. Um, after this first dollar, dollar uh, first dollar amount of savings and risk, one care subtracts any funding obligation obligated to cover one care's expenses as approved by their board of managers. Uh, and then 90% of the remainder of that amount is distributed to each uh, uh, health service area's risk bearing entity, also known as the hospital, while the other 10% is allocated to a performance incentive pool, which we describe a little bit more on the next slide. Um, finally, savings and losses are allocated um, based on HSA level attribution, so it's proportional to the population. On slide 54, we give some more detail about that primary care accountability pool as well as the performance incentive pool. So um, on the primary care accountability pool, practices can either pay into the accountability pool throughout the year as a withhold from the base per member per month that OneCare distributes, um, or elect to receive an invoice from OneCare at settlement if the ACO is required to pay back shared losses. And this was a, a hot topic in, in the FY21 review. Um, the projected total of the primary care accountability pool for this year is, or for the coming year is 2.4 million. That's 15% of total risk. Uh, and then the current policy is for FY21. Um, so we just linked to the policy name there. Um, on the performance incentive pool, that sets aside 10% of the total savings, if there are any, to reward HSAs that perform particularly well on two measures that one care has decided are you know, core measures, and that's uh, per capita cost and avoidable ED visits. Um, it distributes the, the savings, um, the, or I guess the performance incentive pool portion of the savings based on the accrual of PIP points. And um, the current policy is also FY21. Um, so on the next slide, uh, this um, you know fairly unreadable table in slide form um, shows how the risk is distributed by health service area and within health service area by provider type. Um, showing the primary care accountability pool as well as the risk bearing entity share of risk. Um, I, I do want to note that the um, FY21 percentage column does not sum here because of rounding, um, but really the key takeaway is that as previously mentioned, primary care holds 15% of the risk um, and 7% and of that uh, is hospital owned primary care. Um, so this just gives you a sense of kind of how that plays out um, across the state and, and by primary care and hospital. Um, so on slide 56, uh, board members and the public may remember uh, that a significant topic of discussion at last year's presentation was the change in the risk model from the HSA-based risk model to the network-based risk model. And we wanted to do some analysis to see how that played out. 
This slide just summarizes the changes. Uh, in the HSA-based risk model, um, the HSAs were basically treated as mini ACOs with their own total cost of care targets. Now the ACO spreads out that risk, um, as we've described on prior slides, to the whole network based on the population size. Um, shifting from the HSA-based risk model to the network-based risk model um, was intended to increase collaboration across the network. Uh, participants, the hospitals, might have more incentive to look outside their HSA uh, for the more efficient, most efficient care setting. Um, there also might be increased motivation for the ACO to identify and lead strategic planning for system-wide cost control. Uh, the network-based risk model also decreases year-over-year -year volatility associated with small numbers, since some of our, our HSAs are so small. Um, but we, we really wanted to see how that played out across the state. So in um, the round one questions that staff issued, um, staff requested that one care provide an analysis of the 2019 uh, performance, um, you know, shared savings and shared losses uh, distribution, um, and look at that both based on how it was actually distributed according to the HSA-based model um, and how it hypothetically might have been distributed uh, using the newer network-based risk model. Um, the goal was to identify uh, you know, winners and losers, for, for lack of a better term, under the risk model now in use. Um, so slide 57 uh, repeats some of what I just said verbally, but um, we, we, we really want to, uh, we wanted to play out the new, the new policy. So on slide um, 58, we have included this analysis. Um, I want to highlight that negative numbers on the slide are savings and positive number are losses. Uh, the key takeaways here are that the HSA model uh, with its individual HSA total cost of care targets uh, created some big winners and losers. There's significant variation in um, savings or losses across the, the network. Uh, in the network-based model, this really gets smoothed out. So rather than a mix of significant savings and losses, we end up with generally modest savings for most HSAs. Um, we've also uh, flagged in a very kind of simplistic way um, whether each uh, HSA fares better or worse under the new model. Um, but I do want to note that this is specific to 2019. We don't think that this would necessarily track to future years um, because the HSA-based in part because the HSA-based risk model um, is so volatile and, and based on really small numbers. Um, slide 59, uh, you know, put, puts this into to words and provides those key takeaways again. Um, again, there are pros and cons to decreasing that volatility across HSAs. Um, we, we think that decreasing volatility due to the small numbers is a big pro in our state where some communities are really small. Um, the con here is that smoothing out savings and risk across HSAs means that incentives are weaker for participants since, since the, the total savings or risk uh, is more modest for most communities uh, and, and pretty small compared to hospitals' total budgets. Um, so on slide 60, this brings us to 2020. Uh, the financial results from the 2020 payer programs were presented on November 22nd, along with the quality results, and we, we'll talk about that a bit more later in the presentation. Um, I have listed the total amounts here. Um, I want to make an important point uh, that these FY 2020 settlement amounts um, do not go straight to One Care's bottom line. Uh, there are policies in place, uh, the policies that we reviewed earlier, um, which outline how One Care distributes any shared savings payments that they receive at settlement. This policy, uh, the current policy, gives the One Care Board of Managers the opportunity to choose to utilize that some portion of that shared savings received at settlement for other purposes, but in general, it's outlined pretty specifically um, in, in those documents already. Um, so to wrap up this section, our key takeaways are on this slide. Um, the total budgeted risk and reward is 16.2 million for FY22. Um, a pretty solid chunk of this uh, is linked to the primary care accountability pool, um, 2.4 million in total. Uh, that includes 1.3 million from non-hospital primary care. Uh, and we've also summarized the network-based uh, risk model, uh, which we talked about in depth uh, just a moment ago, uh, as well as the performance incentive pool. So um, staff have two recommendations related to payer programs and risk. Um, the first is a condition uh, which is consistent with, la with past years, um, that payer programs must be designed to be scale target qualifying ACO initiatives as defined in the all-payer model agreement to the greatest extent possible. Um, and I, I will not uh, read the full recommendation unless that's the board's preference. Um, and then secondly, on the next slide, we have another condition uh, that is also consistent with past years. 
um, and that is to require OneCare to implement the risk model as described in their budget and to submit documentation of this and seek approval before making changes to the risk model. The ACO reporting manual would also be updated to reflect some uh, related reporting as well. Um, before I pass it back to Marissa, I do want to note that um, previously we had a related condition um, that outlined maximum risk limits uh, and, and set them in line with contracts. Um, in FY22, as I mentioned earlier, um, risk is lower than those past maximums. Uh, so this is something um, that we haven't included in the staff recommendation this year since uh, it does not feel as necessary. Um, but it is something that we could consider addressing in uh, fiscal year 2023 guidance if the board was so inclined, potentially by requiring um, con payer contracts to reflect minimum levels of risk if the board deemed that appropriate. Um, so that is all for payer programs and risk, and I'm going to hand it over to Marissa. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to talk now about payment models and fixed participants fixed perspective payment. So it's going to break down that large um, number that Patrick was talking to um, earlier. I want to start um, by highlighting this diagram from the recent federal evaluation of the all-payer model that was presented by the NORC of the University of Chicago on November uh, 5th at one of our board meetings, um, because I think it's a nice representation of the funds flow in the model and the role of the ACO arrangement. Um, so the ACO, which you see in the middle of the diagram, negotiates agreements with the payers um, who are at the top of the diagram on behalf of their provider network, which you see on the sides, both hospital and um, primary care and non-hospital um, providers. Um, and OneCare serves as the program negotiator uh, and allows the ACO to design, implement, and operationalize alternative payment mechanisms that would otherwise have to be negotiated individually by hospitals or other providers absent the ACO. Uh, the ACO is also able to redistribute funds on behalf of the network toward population health management and reform programs, which you see at the bottom of the diagram. Um, and those benefit the entire network and in some cases uh, as noted in the evaluation, the total population. So recent discussion of these payment mechanisms at this board and in the uh, Agency of Human Services all payer model implementation improvement plan have focused heavily on implementation of fixed perspective payments, um, also called CMS upfront payments or um, Medicare um, all-inclusive population-based payments, um, also referred to as fixed perspective payments that are reconciled to fee for service. So there's a lot of terminology being thrown around here. Um, I want to focus a little bit on these models in my next couple of slides and um, what we see in the data um, at this time. So you can go to slide 65, please. Um, so one cares uh, fixed perspective or fixed payment models um, consist of these two buckets. There are fixed uh, perspective payments to hospitals, um, which consists of the Medicare, uh, the Vermont Medicare um, arrangement, the all-inclusive population-based payment, which is reconciled to fee-for-service, the Medicaid fixed perspective payments, which are unreconciled, and then the Blue Cross Blue Shield fixed perspective payment pilot, which is also reconciled. Um, there's also the comprehensive payment reform, uh, or often referred to as the CPR program to independent primary care. And this is a payer blended fixed payment for uh, independent primary care practices for core primary care services plus additional PMPM for non-core services. Um, the, we have a more uh, in-depth report on the comprehensive payment reform program as requested by the board, but I just pulled out some very high level numbers here. So um, the total CPR payments that were projected or that are, are projected for fiscal year 21 are a total of $6.9 million. So this is the uh, total um, amount um, that is that consists of um, contract money through the payers. And then there's a one care funded share, which in FY21 was 1.2 um, million. So the 1.2 million that you see in one cares financial sheets is the share that's invested by one care at their entity level budget. Um, but the bulk of the payer blended payments are derived through the payer contract, which is in the full accountability budget. 
Um, and again, that FY21 total comes from the CPR report that was submitted by OneCare in July of this year. I do not have the total budgeted payments for the CPR program for FY22, um, but it is included in that FPP CPR line item in the financial sheet, um, which you'll see on the next slide. Um, the OneCare funded share did increase slightly in the FY22 budget to 1.3 million. So on slide, we're already there, slide 65. Um, this is our analysis of fixed prospective payments as a percent of expected total cost of care. Um, this is for the, the 22 budget. Uh, and we also included uh, what are known as the HCP LAN category. So HCP LAN is the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network. The HCP LAN sets the framework that we reference for national measurement of payer program penetration of alternative payment models. The HCP LAN publishes an all payer model framework that defines levels of alternative payment models um, from anywhere from fee for service with no link to quality or value up through the spectrum to comprehensive population based payments or global budgets. I'm not going to go into a, a deeper dive on HCP land framework, but um, wanted to reference it um, here in the slides. If you want to take a look at that framework, we included it in the reference slides at the end of this deck, uh, slide 136. Um, I will note that these categories are not perfect to Vermont's arrangements. Uh, but this is the best framework that we have to provide us a national comparison, and we have used it since the inception of the model. I will also note that there's not one way to design these models. Um, the goal here is to link payments to quality and value, but not all the arrangements have to be a category four um, in order for this to work well. So I just want to talk about the table a little bit. Um, we used average attribution in this table, which are, um, again, estimated um, average numbers that one care submits um, that are used to set their budget because as we know attribution drops off over the year so if you use January 1 or scale um, attribution for these estimates then they would be over budgeting um, but I included these here just to give you an idea of the magnitude of each program uh, staff took the FY22 budgeted figures for expected total cost of care and fixed payments um, to calculate the total fixed payments as a percent of expected total cost of care. And then we categorize them by uh, land category. So the results here are that over 50% of payments in the public payer program are considered category 4B arrangements. Um, now I wanna make a note about this because I know that there's been much discussion about which category um, these uh, payer programs um, fit into. Um, so we looked into that um, and found that, so what happens is payer programs report to the HCP LAN, I think as frequently as, as annually on what type of um, payer arrangements are and what categories they fit into. Um, the Medicaid program reports their fixed perspective payments as um, 4B, and we checked in with CMS Medicare, and they confirmed that the um, Vermont Medicare all-inclusive population-based payments are also reported as 4B, um, even though they are reconciled to fee-for-service. So we did include them in this category, um, though I've made a note uh, about the difference between reconciliation and unreconciliation, because that's been a significant point of discussion in the state. Um, and as has been discussed by the board before, uh, commercial, the commercial program, as you can see here, is far below in this category at 1.1% overall. We um, blended the commercial together because some of those figures um, are uh, proprietary or, or still subject to negotiation. Um, and the categories for the Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP programs, we collected through the rate review process. Um, and they that the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield pilot, as our understanding, is uh, category 4B reconciled. Um, the Blue Cross Blue Shield QHP, they reported as a category 3B and MVP, uh, which is shared savings only, is reported as a category 3A. And then overall, 34% uh, of um, payments in the full accountability budget are um, obviously, these are weighted by payer program are in one of these um, categories. 
Um, another thing that I want to note here is that uh, there's a component of the payer contracts in the CPR, and I am not sure if this is captured here. Um, so we do need to work with one care to make sure that what we've presented in this table is accurate, but this is our best understanding at this time with the numbers that we have. Um, validated reporting on fixed perspective payment and uh, CPR is part of the recommendation in this section. I know it's also a topic of conversation in the hospital budget process. We're trying to make sure we have accurate reporting on the percentage of fixed perspective payments by hospital. Uh, you can go ahead to the next slide, which is 67. And um, this slide summarizes the report that One Care submitted to the Green Mountain Care Board this summer as required in the FY21 budget order. Again, these are One Care developed uh, tables and um, uh, baselines and targets. Um, so I, I still think we have some um, data validation that needs to happen, but this is what they um, reported to us. Table one is the percentage of contract revenue in fixed perspective payments. Now this is uh, for the baseline year, which we chose as 2019, a pre-pandemic year. Um, you'll see that their numbers are really different than the ones I have, and that's because the Medicare um, is not, OneCare did not include Medicare in the FPP as they were interpreting it as, um, or maybe even at the time we all were interpreting it as, um, because it, it's reconciled to fee for service that it that didn't fit into that true fixed perspective payment category. Um, but we have since um, got more information that that, um, well, there's some discussion around it, but that's not the accurate reporting according to HCP LAN. Um, so they're reporting zero um, where we are reporting um, much higher. Um, the, our Medicaid um, numbers are fairly in the line. Again, we're talking about two different years, but um, but they still they still are in line. And then commercial, uh, again, there's a small not, there's a small percentage that is in there, um, though not for the baseline. Um, table two are the targets and milestones for contract revenue and fixed perspective payments from the baseline and then through to. Uh, fiscal year 25. Um, so if we were to just, you know, take these numbers as presented, you can see that for Medicaid and Medicare, we're already there um, for their for their targets with, though they talk about our uh, OneCare discusses, you know, strategies for some continued growth in these programs, particularly Medicare. Essentially, the Medicare line in the OneCare report represents um, what it would look like if we were able to convert those uh, reconciled to um, unreconciled payments um, and some modest growth in Medicare program, I believe. And then Medicaid, again, shows um, some growth, but we are already uh, nearing those targets. Um, the, the, the targets for commercial, um, as you can see, they estimated a target for 22 at 2.9. As far as we could tell, um, we're not we're not at that number for 22. Again, this was done over the summer while the budget was still being developed. Um, our analysis it looks more like it's still around 1.1% overall for commercial. And then there are some pretty ambitious targets there from for 23 through 25. Um, so I want to make sure that um, hit the main the main points here. Um, Okay, so my fourth bullet point there, um, that the the ambitious targets in for FY23 through 25, the strategies that One Care discussed in their report is increasing hospital um, fixed payment programs, increasing inclusion of FQHDs, and increasing the CPR program. I'll note that by magnitude, the first one there, hospital fixed um, payment programs is where um, they think the greatest magnitude of the impact can come from. So I'm going to leave it at that uh, and go to the next slide, which has some key takeaways about the analysis as far um, as, as we can tell at this time. So in past years and in other regulatory processes, Green Mountain Care Board members have indicated a desire to move more of Vermont's healthcare spending to fixed perspective payments. Um, increasing fixed perspective payments and in particular unreconciled FCP requires regulatory action across processes. 
Um, changing the Medicare payment model requires continued partnership with Medicare and providers. And progress on one care's ambitious targets, especially for the commercial program, will require continued monitoring and reporting. So there are some, well, there are, sorry, there are not recommendations. You can go to the next slide, Michelle. Um, and, and by recommendations, I mean there are no um, recommended budget conditions um, at this time, but we do have some next steps which are already in process on this, on this issue. Um, so as previously instructed by the board, the Green Mountain Care Board staff are to continue to engage in rulemaking, or sorry, in rule development as a precursor to formal rulemaking process for a new rule to increase FPP with potential rule to span GMCB's ACO oversight, um, a hospital budget review and health insurance premium rate review processes. So we've determined in our analysis that um, making some kind of, you can't, we can't just order a condition that one care increase these numbers. Um, it has to uh, span regulatory processes. So it includes um, uh, work with the in health and with the insurers and um, and the hospitals um, or through hospital budget review uh, authority. And the first step is that we have engaged with a contractor on options for how to pursue this. Uh, the second uh, bullet, which I touched on, is that in FY22, um, the staff development developed reporting templates uh, will better capture payer ACL payment arrangements, provide guidance to one care on where current payer ACL payment arrangements fall in the land framework and require reporting of reconciled FPP and unreconciled FPP separately. So we've already started this work on how to better capture and make sure that we have consensus on the reporting around this. Um, and we will continue that work through uh, the year. And I think that concludes this section uh, and we're going to move on to population health quality and model of care which i'm also going to introduce for you and work with um, michelle and others because this is a large area of review so this section seven of the budget itself um, is quite large it includes aco quality population health model of care and community integration efforts um, what we're going to talk about today are major programmatic and budget changes that we're seeing in 22, um, population health quality related payment changes, and the clinical focus areas and VBIS priorities. For some background, you, we've used these slides last year um, to frame this section. This slide is meant to boil down the seven criteria that are most applicable to review of the ACO's model of care and population health programs. On the left, uh, the criteria requires that board members review and consider these three major buckets. One is incentives and resources, or we can call those payment changes. Um, two is information or data, and three is efforts or tools. Um, so we think of the review of this section under, under these budgets. On the right, the criteria call out these priorities specifically. Um, they are to strengthen primary care, to integrate with community-based providers and the blueprint for health. Uh, for example, mental health and substance use disorder, which is uh, called out specifically in the criteria, um, to address social determinants of health and the impact of adverse childhood events and the effects on appropriate utilization. Slide 72, please. This is just a, another look. Um, the circles here represent the three budget, sorry, three buckets that the creed key criteria fit into. Um, in the boxes are examples of core competencies of the care model that are identified by one care in their narrative. Um, I use this graphic as a simplified crosswalk of how one care states um, their own core competencies and how they align with our review criteria. You're going to hear more from this soon from our consultant, um, Joe Demore, who's on the line, uh, including his recommendations to one care on how they can strengthen performance in these areas uh, using his expertise as a leader in integrated health systems and high performing ACOs. And then you'll also hear from Joe on his um, regulatory recommendations to the, the board. And I believe now I'm going to pass it to Michelle Degree, who is going to continue with a discussion of the more detailed program changes in FY22 and the recommendations. Thanks, Marissa. I just want to clarify that everyone can hear me okay. 
Okay. Uh, so, um, as Marissa mentioned, you know, we're looking at the most notable changes here. So, ensuring that um, the staff are bringing to the board members and uh, the public for consideration just what we sort of honed in on as high priority areas that have changed the most significantly. So, um, as you see through the bucketed categories on the screen, we have the Evaluation Incentive Fund, Rise Vermont Care Navigator, and Care Coordination Payments. I sort of think of the last two sort of together, but I'll talk through them a little bit more in detail. So under the value-based incentive fund, as you can see, um, it was reduced or it's proposed to be reduced in the 2022 budget. Um, it's down to 1 million. It was 2.24 million in fiscal year 2021. Um, I think the um, something to call out here from One Care Submission is that the intended focus of the 2022 program is in alignment with the current 2021 program with respect to the um, provider payment structures and the focused quality metrics. So I'll talk about those in a little bit more detail later, but OneCare continued with its four quality metric um, program in the VBIF space from 2021 into 2022, just to allow for some more continuity there. Uh, under the RISE Vermont program, um, I'm sure you recall from OneCare's presentation, RISE is phasing out um, in 2022. So it's funded for the first half, the first six months of 2022. Um, and OneCare cites this as a shift from community-based to clinical prevention model. Under Care Navigator, uh, documentation requirements in Care Navigator have become optional. Um, so use of Care Navigator is no longer required to receive those care coordination payments. I will add that OneCare stated that it's working on alternate reporting modalities to its network. So if Care Navigator is not being used by everyone, they're working on sort of developing and thinking through ways to still get that um, information out to their network. Under the care coordination payments, so again, sort of tying back to Care Navigator, one cares decoupling care coordination payments from the use of Care Navigator. Um, so this change reduces the maintenance costs of that overall care coordination system. Um, of note, um, payments are now tied to total cost of care and other metrics, which are still likely to be tied to total cost of care and other metrics, which are still to be determined. So some things that one care mentioned in its narrative were things like uh, measures such as change in total cost of care, avoidable ED utilization, and inpatient utilization are areas of examples um, of focus with clear correlation to desirable total cost of care and quality outcomes. So just sort of trying to tie that back to overall improvement of health in their um, in their space. Um, Michelle, you can go to the next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, well, just about. 30 seconds ago, uh, population health, uh, the value-based incentive fund. So again, the proposed amount there is a million dollars. These are the four clinical focus areas or VBIF priorities that remain the same in the proposed 2022 budget. I will try to use those, I will try to use one term, which is VBIF, but of note, they are the same as one cares clinical focus areas. So those four measures are also the clinical focus areas um, of the network in 2022. Um, uh, the, those areas remained steady. Um, so again, diabetes, hemoglobin A1C, controlling high blood pressure, early childhood development and screening and uh, depression screening and follow-up. One thing to just point out here is the very close alignment with the all-payer ACO model metrics that we are, the state is responsible for reporting um, on behalf of our agreement with CMMI. Um, and with that, I'm going to briefly turn it over to Patrick for a couple of slides before we come back for some staff recommendations. Thank you, Michelle. <clears throat> so what we have on slide 75 is a snapshot of the uh, population health and payment reform investment activity over the last several fiscal cycles here, um, ending with 2022 budget proposal. Um, we have a 3.5% increase from projection to budget in blueprint programs. You can see there that since 2019, there's been an, an increase uh, year over year um, in, in, in those investments, rising to nine, uh, nine million dollars in fiscal year 2022. In the population health investments, um, <clears throat> we have a 3.9% increase in the overall component of that from projection. However, if we're to compare it to the 30 plus million dollars they originally budgeted for 2021, they're actually coming down about 4%. So that means they don't intend to hit 
their 2021 original budgeted figure. And so the 2022 amount of almost $29 million falls right in between the projection that we see here on the screen and what they budgeted, which was $30 million plus for 2021. So there's kind of a dueling narrative there that it, it looks like it's an increase over the projection, but it's really a reduction when we look at the budget to budget uh, perspective. Um, PHM revenues as a percentage of total have declined since 2019. Um, some of that has to do with the fact that that measurement is weighted against the total. So you can see between 2019 and 2020, um, the total revenue is just about doubled, um, which is a pretty substantial increase when you think about the dollars that are, are passing through this organization. So um, it's not that, I mean, the dollar component of population health has fallen, but in proportion to the growth that we've seen in total revenue, um, it's driving that percentage figure down. Uh, and as the next bullet points to um, total revenues between projection and budget are rising about 12% as proposed here today. And regarding the PHM investment, there is no benchmark for the right ratio. Uh, the programs uh, don't tend to scale up at the same time or at the same rate as attribution does. Next slide, please. So here's a little more granular detail. Uh, again, that chronological sequence over time. If we look at 2019, uh, we have in our midst there growth potential of these investments and that one care is investing money into population health programs. We're seeing that pretty substantial leap from year to year, 2018 to 2019. It's also the last uh, pre-pandemic year um, as we walked through the hospital budgets, we noted that quite often. So when we look at that growth potential year and then where we're going in 2022, we're seeing some, we're seeing a couple of different uh, components occurring here. One is that um, <clears throat> uh, blueprint programs are remaining strong. We just saw that they're being, they're, the investments are growing. Um, they've grown 13% from 2022 or 2019. And also the uh, population health management payment piece has increased 77% over 2019. Now those two components make up 64% of your fiscal year 2022 PHM budget. So if those remain strong or they grow, they're gonna prop up the total $28.3 million investment that's being made. So there are, there are about $18.5 million worth of that total spent. But if you look at some of the other pieces here, as they're color-coded, specifically looking at that green chunk in 2019, the third one up from the bottom, that's your VBIF. And you can see over time here that the investments there are being squeezed. And as Michelle noted, it's about $2.5 million in the prior year. It's now down to $1 million. So we're really seeing that investment kind of trickle off after that um, growth component in 2019. Uh, complex care program is down 34% since 2019, going into 2022. Um, <clears throat> the VBIF piece contributes an 87% reduction from its 2019 comparable. So there's a lot of activity here where investments are kind of being whittled down in the population health piece. Um, CPR program is 41% lower than its 2019 comparable. Um, and there is no funding for uh, PCP engagement incentives in 2022, either Blue Cross or uh, Medicaid expanded. So we are seeing a reduction in a variety of these programs. But again, they're, they're being propped up by the strength of um, <clears throat> the population health management payment and the uh, increased blueprint investments, which again, make up about 64% of that total figure you'll see in 22. So Michelle, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, so for the largest section, we tried to keep it pretty small, but that also means you're about to see a handful of recommendations. So uh, key takeaways here, again, value-based incentive fund being reduced. Um, we've got changes to the Rise Vermont and Care Navigator platforms and care coordination payments, and that results in a total reduction in the PHM category ex of expenditures of about $2.8 million. Michelle, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so starting with some recommendations here, I'll speak to um, all the ones we have under this category. So the first one that you see um, in front of you, and uh, I will say slide, I wanna make sure folks who are on the 
screen 78 if you are uh, following along, um, are, uh, is a carryover from fiscal year's 2021 budget order. So this is just asking um, that OneCare uh, fund the budget as proposed and if any changes um, or uh, uh, PHM programs and reporting change by the with that one care come back and let us know with their revised budget submission. So again, by the end of quarter one, 2022. Sorry, I've got a lot of years in my head. <laughs> um, Michelle, if you go to the next slide. Our second recommendation, again, this is um, one that we've had uh, for quite some time now. So in 2022, we're asking one care fund sash in the amount um, that, that you see on your screen there, which is uh, the budgeted amount plus an inflationary factor and the same for the blueprint for health um, to just kind of sum that up for you so you don't have to do the math. Um, once you trend those uh, three and a half percent, it's $9,073,982 total that we're asking them to put into that bucket. Um, this is what uh, OneCare proposed in their budget um, and staff recommends that that trend uh, be accepted. So if we can move to the next one. Thank you. Um, so our third half recommendation, future recommendation is um, around the VBIF. So um, as you sort of heard me talk about, the staff here um, are really expecting to recommend an increase above the budgeted amount of a million dollars. Um, we need a little bit of additional time to sort of work through some information that we've received and making sure that we are really setting the board up with um, the best information possible to be able to make that recommendation and potential um, budget order condition. Uh, and so we, um, as you heard earlier, are proposing to come back to you next week with that recommendation. Um, and just a reminder, sort of under there on the considerations, you see that in the past, the VBIF has ranged anywhere from four to six and a half million dollars in prior years. And you saw that um, in Patrick's slides as well, you saw that detailed out. So just um, sort of the basis for our uh, sort of thought process around making sure that that the staff are recommending that we think that should be increased. Um, and then Michelle, you can go to the next slide. This is our last uh, population health uh, recommendation here. Um, our fourth and final recommendation here is another carryover. This has been included in some aspect, uh, some level of detail since 2018 budget order, so since the first one. Um, I have all of the conditions listed out if you want to know what they are, but I won't go through them now, uh, just to say that this has been included since 2018. And so again, we're asking One Care's administrative expenses to be less than the health care savings. Um, and with that, I believe I turn it back over to Sarah Kinsler. So before you do, Michelle, um, I've had multiple requests for a bio break. Okay. Um, I thought that we could uh, get through the staff presentation, but it's clear from uh, the text messages that most people cannot. So I think this would be a good time to take a, a bio break and we'll resume in 10 minutes at uh, 2.52. So, Kara, if you could put something up on the screen that just lets people know that uh, we're on a bio break to 252, it would be great. Thank you, everybody. This meeting is in recess. So we have all, all the board members back. Um, I'm going to call the meeting back to order. And um, Michelle, you were in the process of handing it off to Sarah. So I, I was. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so now we are going to move into presenting results to date, which will include some results and analyses related to the all pair model, as well as specific to ACO performance. Um, this slide tries to kind of distinguish between these, uh, but also note that they definitely inform each other. So on our um, next slide, we've just got a list of the um, results that we will be uh, we will be speaking to today. Um, the first is um, results on the federal all pair model evaluation by NORC, uh, results on all pair model scale targets, um, ACO 2020 pair program results, which we already covered a little bit, and then an analysis done by uh, the GMCB's all pair model analytics contractor Mathematica policy research. So I am going to speak to the federal all pair model evaluation. Um, these are the findings from the first report that has come out of the, the federal government's evaluation of Vermont's all-pair model. 
Um, the results were presented to the board on November 5th, and on the next slide, there's a link to the Green Mountain Care Board staff slides, as well as the slides that NORC actually presented at that meeting. Um, I, it, as By way of introduction, I'll just say that the Vermont All Pair model, like all federal demonstrations, is required to be evaluated. NORC, a national firm that has extensive experience in health services research and specifically in evaluating state demonstration models like the All Pair model, was hired by CMMI for this job. Um, we want to note that Medicare is the key focus of this evaluation, though it does also consider the wider impact as well, and you'll see uh, that evident in the report if you review it. Um, I've linked to uh, the report itself, as well as the summary of the report and all the technical appendices on this slide for easy, easy finding. So the next slide um, covers the um, some highlights from those the key findings from this report. Um, I do want to note that this is not a totally comprehensive list and obviously does not go into detail, but these are kind of the things that we, we picked out as most relevant to this conversation. Um, so in the first box, the report shows statistically significant Medicare spending and utilization reductions, both for the Medicare ACO program and for the full Vermont Medicare fee-for-service population um, relative to a comparison group. Um, this is an area of um, where there's been a lot of kind of conversation and confusion. Um, I do want to note that uh, these spending re reductions and all of the results in the report are not in comparison to past Vermont performance. Um, the report methodology compares Vermont to a comparison group rather than to Vermont's baseline performance. And so the results can, ref are, are, can reflect complex trends, including trends in the intervention group, um, Vermont and the Vermont ACO, or in the comparison group. Um, this is not always, uh, this is not always clear, but it's something that we really want to make sure that folks understand. Um, in the next box, the qualitative findings include improved cohesion around shared goals and collaboration across the state payers and providers. Um, the report also found uh, spillover effects, which I kind of alluded to on the prior slide, um, to the full Vermont population, noting that some of the ACO and hospitals population health initiatives are payer blind and serve ACO and, ACO and non ACO beneficiaries alike. Uh, as well as that Vermont has a long history of investment in primary care and population health, a statewide culture of reform, and a strong regulator in the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, all of these things kind of add complexity to this evaluation um, and, and may help explain why we're seeing um, benefits at the population level. Um, in the next box, um, the evaluators did find a lack of widespread understanding of the model, a perceived lack of transparency, uh, and some distrust that have all contributed to challenges in meeting practitioners and the public in the model. Uh, and then finally, um, the report found that transformation will require a more comprehensive transition to value-based payment and a focus on upstream investments that address social determinants of health um, looking forward. So um, I've again linked to the slides from the November 5th presentation here. Uh, and now we are going to transition to discussing all pair model scale, uh, and I'll be handing it over to Russ McCracken and Michelle Degree. Uh, great, thank you, Sarah. This is Russ McCracken, uh, staff attorney here with the board, and I'm going to go through here the uh, requirements in the APM agreement for scale qualifying a ACO initiatives. Um, this slide here set sets out the requirements there from section 6B of the agreement. And I'll walk through them here. Um, the first is that the arrangement has a possibility of shared savings uh, for achieving goals related to quality of care or utilization. Um, you know, shared savings being monetary amounts owed by the payer to the ACO. Um, the second requirement sets out some criteria for the shared savings and, um, if applicable, shared losses. So. The shared savings as a percentage of expenditures less than the benchmark is a minimum of 30%. If the arrangement also has a shared loss, then there's a, a similar uh, requirement there for it. Um, but the baseline requirement here is that the arrangement has shared savings, and this section doesn't indirectly add a requirement for shared losses. Uh, third, the arrangement has to have services comparable to a defined um, set of services in the APM agreement, and those associated expenditures are included in the determination of uh, any shared losses and shared savings. And finally, the, the ACO's benchmark shared services, shared losses, or a combination is tied to the quality of care that the ACO delivers uh, and or the health of its aligned beneficiaries. Uh, so next slide, Michelle. To kind of summarize it, 
the main points here are that uh, to be a scale qualifying initiative, the arrangement has to have the possibility for shared savings, but does not require shared risk. Really, what we mean here is that it doesn't the arrangement doesn't require the possibility of shared losses um, as a, a necessary element to be a scale qualifying ACR initiative. Uh, for example, the Blue Cross Blue Shield um, primary non-risk cohort is in a is a, a cohort that doesn't participate in either shared risk or shared savings, so it would not qual it would not be considered a scale qualifying ACO initiative. Um, the next requirement, they said, there's a 30 percent uh, minimum a share of the uh, shared savings or risk corridor um, that goes to the ACO in a. Uh, a clearly made up example here to illustrate with some uh, fictional dollar amounts. If a program's total cost of care target was a million dollars and had a contracted corridor of 3%, um, either uh, upside or downside of that um, total cost of care, then the ACO share of that shared savings has to be at least 30% of the 3% um, so we get to about nine thousand dollars in that in that illustration. Um, as I mentioned in the private previous slide, there has to be alignment between the arrangement and the services included in the total cost of care target um, with what is defined in the APM agreement, and uh, it's fairly comparable to Medicare's Part A and B. Uh, and lastly, the financial components have to be tied to quality and or health outcomes. Uh, next slide, Michelle. Great, so with respect to the process, um, the GMCB and staff receive some uh, kind of basic information about each payer contract that's anticipated for the following year as part of the ACO's budget submission. Um, the contracts aren't final, uh, but this provides a bit of an early look um, for us at what's expected to be included in those in those contracts. Um, with respect to timing, the Medicare and Medicaid contracts have to be executed by December 31st. Uh, so we have those at the year's end, though not always uh, in time or during the ACO budget review process. The uh, commercial program contracts are typically signed in the spring of the program year. Once the uh, payer contract is finalized, um, GMCB uh, receives a copy, reviews it, focuses on um, changes from prior years and making and checking it against the requirements for um, uh, a, a scale target uh, initiative. And once we've done that analysis, that gets incorporated into the report that the board sends to CMMI uh, in the summer of each year. And with that, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Michelle. Thanks, Russ. OK, so uh, kind of looping back to what Russ just said and wanting to give the board an idea of projections for fiscal year uh, or performance year five, which is uh, calendar year 2022. So the uh, slide that you're seeing is estimated scale based on current information that we have available to us. I can't emphasize enough that this will change. Uh, final 2021 results will be incorporated into the 2021 scale target and alignment report, which is due in June, the report that Russ just alluded to. Um, and again, something to point out here for both 2021 and 2022 is that we're not meeting those um, quite ambitious scale targets, which were recognized by CMMI as unattainable. Um, we are, however, making some progress in the all payer space, thanks in large part to some growing commercial attribution. Um, so again, a couple of caveats here being that uh, currently the 2021 and 2022 data are utilizing 2020 population estimates. Uh, that's how we get to our final calculation. So that will be updated with the 2021 scale report, um, given that at that time we'll have 2021 estimates. Um, and uh, to note that the numbers that you're seeing here, um, what I have included for counts 
are the numbers that I've received directly from Medicare and DIVA for their prospective attribution estimates. Um, so those two numbers, uh, you'll see them again on a couple of slides, um, might not directly match with what was in OneCare's budget, but are the numbers that we ultimately include in scale. So I wanted to try and keep that consistent throughout the process. Um, so Michelle, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so here again, you're seeing the first two rows there are those prospective tar uh, estimates that come directly from the payer. Um, just wanted to sort of break scale down a little bit more for you and give you another look at scale. Um, obviously here we're looking by payer type. Um, and again, 2021 and 2022 will change with that updated um, uh, population estimate and with updated payer contracts once those are final, so specifically in that commercial space. Um, so we've broken this out by fully insured and scale qualifying self-insured, so this would not include any um, of currently only Blue Cross offering um, any program that is not scale target qualifying. Michelle, you can go to the next slide. A third and final look um, at scale here. So this is sort of the deepest dive that I'll give you into payer contract scale. Um, again, this one really specifically calls out that non-scale qualifying group in that Blue Cross Blue Shield space. It's the grayed out row. So if you do the math, uh, that, that number does not count towards that commercial sort of bolded row there. Um, again, lots of caveats here. I think you'll see we've got six uh, footnotes just to keep in mind um, and consider as we um, move forward with these. Um, again, you know, the, our sort of source of truth for a lot of this will come from payer contracts. So once those are finalized, that, that number will be incorporated into our next scale report and we'll have better estimates at that time. Um, Michelle, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, one big piece here that we wanted to touch on as we continue to the advertisements for MA plans operating in Vermont and as the board has um, spoken about in the past and I know was brought up during One Cares budget hearing um, is sort of, you know, we're seeing these advertisements for MA and the growing population that's selecting those MA plans. Um, so as you can see from this table, since the signing of the agreement, uh, Medicare Advantage enrollment has more than doubled. Concerns here uh, include really the biggest concern is the potential for higher average expenditures. So beneficiaries opting into uh, Medicare Advantage plans tend to show lower average expenditures, which means the average expenditure for the traditional Medicare population may increase because they're losing those folks who would have a lower expenditure and would sort of um, net that out. Similarly, since Medicare Advantage is categorized with commercial populations according to the terms of the agreement, um, it will potentially inflate expenditures within, within that commercial group. So we just wanted to sort of frame that, put that out there. There is a staff recommendation that we'll bring to you in a few slides, but I wanted to sort of frame that the best way that I could <laughs> to show you how that population continues to grow. And again, um, we did include uh, some breakdown of this in our 2020 scale report where we sort of offered a few alternatives where this population was removed uh, from that scale denominator. We still did not meet scale, though we were closer. So I think just continuing to monitor this shift is really important. And I wanted to bring that to the board's attention. Um, Michelle, you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So some key takeaways from this section. Um, uh, so again, the waiver of enforcement from CMMI. So we are no longer um, accountable for the targets that are in the agreement, though we will continue to report on scale. Um, that is still a requirement. Uh, we will continue um, that through through. 2022, um, if the agreement is extended, which you heard um, at uh, last week's board meeting, then that would continue through 2023, which means reporting would be complete in 2024. Um, so just reminding you all of kind of the timing of that. Um, and a couple of points that we just really wanted to make sure were reinforced here that scale achievement is not necessarily a reflection of ACO performance. It um, includes many factors like care patterns, insurance market patterns, um, movement to the self-insured market, 
um, you know, we have to consider folks who might not report into vCares, and so we might not have that information as well. Um, continued growth, again, in that Medicare Advantage enrollment space, um, that could potentially impact our ability to increase scale and could decrease programmatic alignment with the Medicare um, in the Medicare space um, if those plans don't participate in the model. Thanks. <laughs> um, so for scale recommendations, um, the the big one here is that we're recommending staff are recommending that one care work with MA plans operating in Vermont with a special focus on those plans offered by Blue Cross and the UVM MVP program, since there are already existing contractual agreements with those two payers, uh, to develop scale target qualifying programs for the next fiscal year, so fiscal year 2023. Um, again, sort of just exploring this space, um, a consideration that we wanna make sure is included in the reporting manual and something that staff will also continue to monitor is the impact of changes in that MA enrollment and the potential impact on risk scores um, and how that could uh, potentially affect one care's total cost of care targets. And I'll talk in a little bit more detail about that when we get into the, um, Mathematica analysis, but I wanted to flag that as well, that um, risk scores here are going to potentially play uh, play a part. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, so I will continue. We're on a ride now. I will continue to talk about uh, the uh, 2020 payer results. So again, we talked about this on November 22nd. Um, all the payers came in front of the board as a payer panel. Just a reminder here, Sarah also already talked through this slide. Um, so just a reminder here of the settlement dollars that were realized for the 2020 payer program. Michelle, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. And a reminder of um, how that should go in terms of quality performance. So um, a big thing here, so the quality scores um, in most cases, as you can see, uh, were reporting only, and that's due to the public health emergency. Um, so for those, the ACO was reported, uh, was awarded 100% scores for reporting on quality metrics. Um, we are still figuring out what that will look like for the 2021 space. I think it will differ by payer program, but something to just consider um, is that given that the public health emergency is by no means over, um, we have to kind of think, think about how that uh, has the potential to impact 2021 as well. Shall I can go to the next slide? All right. Uh, now I'm going to move into a somewhat um, different topic. So uh, as Sarah mentioned earlier, Mathematica Policy Research is the GMCB's analytics contractor for the all-pair ACO model. Um, many of you are familiar. We've had uh, Shule Garovich present at board meetings before, um, some on behalf of, um, uh, for uh, reports that they've helped us write for the model, but um, also, she's come uh, before the board uh, just for her vast knowledge of many other things. Um, so this specific analysis that we had done um, is comparing ACO and non-ACO populations from 2017 to 2019. Again, this utilizes a lot of claims data, so that's why the for, that's the reason for that time frame. Um, used a difference in difference and a regression analysis for a subset of measures. Those measures relate to cost. There's a couple of HEDIS measures in there, so similar to the HEDIS measures that we find in the uh, all-payer uh, model agreement. And then there are a handful of prevention quality indicators measures. Uh, so in case folks aren't uh, familiar with, I wanted to give a high-level overview of the Prevention quality indicators or PQI measures. Um, they identify issues uh, of access to outpatient care, including appropriate follow-up care after hospital discharge. Um, and uh, more specifically, they're population-based indicators that capture all cases of potentially preventable complications that could occur in a given population, either during a hospitalization or in a subsequent hospitalization. So they're a really key tool that's can often be utilized in community health needs assessments. So I think something to flag maybe as we think about CHNA is in our hospital budget process, but that is for another time. Um, the report itself 
itself is very detailed, uh, and I'm not going to go through every measure that Mathematica reported out to us on. Um, the report is linked on our website. Um, and I think it's important to note that what, what we will go through are the measures that are closely aligned with One Care's value-based incentive fund um, measures and or um, also really closely aligned with the all-payer model itself. Um, what this that's fine that's good you can stay on this slide um one thing to sort of note is that what i will go through is the more closely related to the regression analysis findings um so that controls for things like member risk age gender length of aco enrollment and hospital service area um and again the report itself has 16 measures i will not go through all 16 measures uh, a couple of important things to note here, the results themselves are not causal. Um, since ACO participation depends on provider participation and characteristics, characteristics of the patients, the populations of those attributed and those not are likely to be different. The non-ACO group is less representative. And the reason for that is that patients who are not attributed are relatively more likely to be excluded due to uh, an enrollment factor or zero dollars in expenditures, which can in, may distort the comparisons that we look at. And the Medicare Advantage population is grouped with commercial pairs. Again, that's per the agreement. That's how we look at them in that space. And that's how um, they were continued to be evaluated here. You can go to the next slide, Michelle. Thank you. So this is just showing uh, the average membership that was included in that analysis again, 2017 to 2019. Um, so if you look there, of all of the all of the membership there, those included in the analysis is about 85.4 percent. There's a reference slide later on that goes through um, each payer and and those estimated. Um, or the membership included in analysis. This one's just prettier, so we included it here, but there is a table at, um, for reference where you can look at the actual member months. You can go to the next slide, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, pointing back to an earlier conversation and the recommendation that I gave uh, on uh, the Medicare Advantage, but specifically talking here about risk scores. So this slide really illustrates that difference and widening gap of the risk score specifically here in the Medicaid space for the ACO and non-ACO populations. You can see in the commercial and the Medicare, I'm sorry, in the Medicare space, I misspoke, Medicare, not Medicaid. Uh, you can see in the commercial and Medicaid space, those are relatively close, but in that Medicare space, you see that widening gap there um, of the non-ACO and the ACO uh, attributed or the comparison groups there um, really widening. And also, high above the risk score of the, the rest of the population included. Michelle, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So here's a snapshot of some of the analysis. So um, again, this is just a subset of the measures that were included, but as you can see here, um, there where we're seeing better performance in the ACO attributed group are those areas that are green. Uh, the blue is results that are statistically better in the group who are not attributed to the ACO, and then the orange is if they were not statistically significantly different. So here, um, one to point out is that follow-up after discharge from the ED for alcohol or other drug abuse or dependence. That is an all-payer model measure. Um, and just looking across the pairs there again, 2017 to 2019. Um, so just reminding ourselves that this would be, you know, only the first two years that the model was in effect. Um, a couple of things I wanted to note just while we're looking at this slide or while folks are taking it in is from the ACO budget itself, um, part of that submission included the top prevalent conditions in their uh, HSAs participating. And so one of the things I just wanted to call out was that anxiety was a top prevalent condition for many HSAs in the Medicaid program. And in, their, in those where it wasn't the top condition, it was the second or third most prevalent. Um, and other prevalent conditions in that Medicaid space included depression and adjustment disorder or tobacco. And I call that out because some of those will fall under 
um, the mental health bucket in terms of the way um, things are coded or classified um, through CCM. ICD-9, 10. <laughs> um, you can go to the next slide, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, so again, here, same, uh, same scoring color rubric. Um, again, so here we're seeing <laughs> commercial ACO members have greater reductions in admissions for, you're seeing here, diabetes with long-term complications and that chronic obstructive pulmonary disease um, and the diabetes admission rate. So again, these are, um, tie back to the ACOs, uh, VBIF areas, and also tie back to the all-pair model, which is why I want to call them out. Um, Medicaid members here, you're seeing um, hypertension and diabetes admission uh, here. And then in the Medicare results, um, we're seeing statistically better in the non-ACO group. But again, thinking back to the fact that risk scores are accounted for here, and it's only the first couple of years of the model that we would be looking at, I think if we continue to um, assess this, you know, our hope would be that we would see that change. And again, from the One Care budget, hypertension was the top prevalent condition for all HSAs in the Medicare space. And in the commercial space, the ACO identified hypertension and anxiety as the top two prevalent conditions in all of their commercial payer contracts. Um, Shall I can go to the next slide? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, this is my last one, I think. Uh, so some key takeaways here. One cares uh, clinical focus areas or those VBIF priorities remained the same. And based on the analyses that I just very briefly high level walked through, I really do encourage folks to look at that uh, report on our website. Um, the evaluation conducted, um, it really seems to be in line with the areas that One Care itself has noted for improvement. And again, in um, in the space where the state is committed to improving uh, the health of the population through the model itself. And with that, I believe I turn it over to Marissa. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you to everyone for bearing with us. Um, we, are, we recognize that we are presenting a lot of material today. Uh, we hope, um, even though there's a lot, um, and we still feel like we've been flying through it, so we hope people will have some time um, you know, outside of this presentation to spend some more time with the slides and the, and the data we're presenting. Um, but we are nearing the final sections, um, but we still have uh, some information to go. So. Um, I am going to move on here to a uh, section we're calling Green Mountain Care Board Regulatory Levers to Foster a High-Performing Health System. We're going to start to try to bring it together here. Um, so ACO oversight is an opportunity for the Green Mountain Care Board to drive results on all-pair model agreement targets and more generally toward a high-performing health system for Vermonters. Uh, we have been working with AHS and partners um, uh, through the uh, implementation improvement plan um, to drive improvement on all pair model targets. Um, as well, in May of 2021, we had uh, Michael Baylett from Baylett Health um, present to the board on core competencies of high performing ACOs to help us improve our ACO oversight process. Um, we have since expanded on this work in FY22 uh, budget and certification review. Uh, you can go ahead to the next slide, please. So to that end, in the fall of 2021, the Green Mountain Care Board engaged the more health advisors to support its ACO oversight through a subcontract with Baylet Health. This was to provide expert consultation to support assessing one care's performance on two core competencies as identified by Baylet. Those are population, population health management and managing with data. Um, and I'm going to bring it back to Sarah's uh, sort of high-level recommendations at the beginning of the presentation um, that we are that these recommendations that Joe have developed for us are helping um, us to ensure that the ACO management drives continuous improvement um, consistent with high-performing ACOs, and we're hoping that these high-level recommendations will help reduce um, administrative burden in the regulatory process. Um, with less focus on granular budget um, line items. Um, so to introduce 
uh, Joe for you. He has 30 plus years focused on building and developing regional integrated health systems, including integrating comprehensive delivery systems and health plans and building several provider sponsored health plans. He's a former vice president of strategy, innovation and population health at Premier Consulting Solutions, responsible for assisting physician groups, hospitals and health systems, health plans and integrated health systems in implementing population health management arrangements, including ACOs with a team of 80 consultants. Um, and he was a health system CEO and leader for nearly two decades. Um, it has been a uh, pleasure working with Joe. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to him to present his recommendation. Thank you, Marissa. Can everyone hear me OK? Uh, can you hear me OK? Yes, and see me. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a real honor for me to participate in, in such an innovative approach to healthcare. Uh, healthcare is complex. One of my mentors, Peter Drucker, used to say that healthcare management is the most complex management because we have multiple constituencies who have multiple roles. Uh, and so my goal, uh, if we can go on to the next slide here, my goal today is, is to take just 10 or 15 minutes and provide you with a summary of the preliminary report that we that I've put together for, for uh, the Green Mountain uh, Care Board and for One Care to, to really help um, move this ACO to its full potential. I, I believe you have such a unique and tremendous opportunity here to, to really do something that's, uh, that's outstanding and could be a national uh, sample example for uh, the country. And uh, my goal is to really help identify some opportunities that you can implement fairly easily uh, without uh, tremendous expenses to help live to that, that future. Um, so the, the, the goals that I've kind of tried to summarize are, number one, let's make it data-driven. Data-driven benchmarking and dashboards will really help everybody. They'll help uh, one cares management move towards more of a data driven approach to management. It will help uh, the Green Mountain Care Board move more towards a uh, data driven regulatory process. And thirdly, it'll help move the whole transformation of healthcare to more of a value based model for patients and the population, which is the, the whole reason we all are here today to help people to improve care, to improve outcomes, to lower cost. And I believe what, what you're gonna hear in a few minutes now will help us do that. And I've tried to identify uh, five key areas of recommendations. The first is, is this data-driven approach to benchmarking and dashboards. The second is integrating this into the One Care Continuous Performance Improvement Program that they've espoused. And, and what I'm talking about is not just trying to, to match the averages or the, the mean of other ACOs, but to match best practices. This is really important because if you wanna be a leader, if you wanna be outstanding, you can't be average. You've gotta to go to best practices and borrow from the organizations that have already implemented key pieces of best practices based on data not based on reputation or rumor, but based on hard data. Uh, the third is recommending that, that one care be required every quarter to report benchmarking tables to uh, the Green uh, Mountain Care Board. And, and that this, would, this requirement would include not only providing uh, the results compared to targets, but identifying where the best opportunities are for improvement, based again on best practices, not based on being average. Uh, fourth, uh, developing a risk uh, mitigation program, which basically says each year identify the highest risk areas to our organization, to One Care, and developing a mitigation plan to prevent those high risk areas from occurring. And I'll give a couple of examples in a few minutes. And lastly, using as a starting point, the, the core competencies that, that Michael Bailett presented in, in May, and then adding on my experience of working at uh, about 200 ACOs across the country the last 11 years, uh, based upon those two experiences, 
I've identified 30 recommendations that are very specific for one care uh, to improve their core capabilities and their processes in order to reach this, this model of being one of the most outstanding ACOs in the country. And again, uh, th this, these 30 recommendations are, are built upon these core capabilities. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I would, uh, what I tried to do is, is identify and break this down into component parts. The first part is to, to develop these dashboards and benchmarking program based upon each of the three major play players, Medicare, Medicaid, and your commercial payers, because you really have three ACO arrangements. Now, and start with Medicare, because the Medicare data is available, it's reliable. We have over 10, about 10 years of experience in working with benchmarking in Medicare, and it's your largest revenue size that you're dealing with. And then soon to be followed with Medicaid and commercial uh, payer benchmarking, which, are, which again are based upon unique populations. All three populations are very, have different, different attributes. Second, uh, break those benchmarking tables into five areas. And I've identified those five areas below. The first being looking at use rates, like ED visits per thousand, uh, you, you know, and again, it, it's, it's a tool that, that many ACOs have already begun to measure and, and do a great job of moving patients out of the emergency room into urgent care, into primary care offices where they get more timely care, less costly care, and really better care. The overwhelming visits to emergency rooms in America are non-emergent and, and no, do not need to be in the emergency room. The second area is measuring cost per capita. And again, looking at what does it totally cost us to care for a person? What does it cost to provide primary care to a person, specialty care? post-acute care? What are the levers we can use to lower overall cost of care? Third, quality. Uh, for example, a great example, uh, an excellent example of quality is, is diabetes. We, we know the old fee-for-service model rewarded complications with diabetics, the wrong thing to do. The new model, value-based care, rewards keeping the hemoglobin A1C below seven, it rewards keeping people healthy. It rewards keeping people with diabetes out of the emergency room, out of the hospital, and lowering overall costs. We know that's better quality, lower cost. Third, patient engagement and satisfaction. We know that getting people involved in their care lowers cost and improves outcomes. And there are techniques we can use that I'll describe in a minute to do that. Uh, and lastly, this is kind of a new area, it seems, for a lot of folks, and that's clinical appropriateness. And that's using evidence-based, clinical, proven concepts to improve care and to make sure care is delivered in the lowest cost location at the, at, at the highest quality and most appropriate location. And, and you, can, you can, let me give you a couple of examples because many people are not familiar with this. First, is if you look at the CMS Care Compare website, there are plenty of examples on that website about how to lower uh, utilization rates in inappropriate areas. An example would be um, using an, uh, for back pain, using an MRI before other treatment modes are tried. We all know the majority of back pains are muscle pulls, not necessarily spinal injuries. And so many places are still doing MRIs before they even look at the muscle issue. There, there are others, the use of clinical protocols for sepsis, the use of clinical protocols for CT scanning. Um, there, there's an, a national organization called Choosing Wisely, and you can go on their website, choosingwisely.org, and you can identify hundreds of clinical appropriateness criteria developed by over 50 physician professional societies where physicians have gotten together and said, let's figure out the best way to treat specific conditions. An example would be a child with a head injury, a child under the age of 10 with a head injury. We, we know that a child with a developing brain is susceptible to radiation exposure that could be damaging. 
in getting an immediate CT scan on a patient, a young child with a head, with a head injury, puts the patient at risk for tremendous radiation exposure. Uh, the average CT scan has the same exposure of about 100 chest x-rays, tremendous radiation, versus observing the child for a 24-hour period. One ACO in Chicago that I've worked with adopted this choosing wisely criteria for, for head injuries in children. And what they implemented was a program where the emergency department physician had to explain to the parents the two options, CT scan or observation for 24 hours. After a one year, 100% of the patients chose observation, the parents. And, and so what it did, it lowered the cost of care they didn't have any bad outcomes. They didn't get sued because the parents were involved in the decision. This same principle has been applied by some commercial organizations to integrate this same protocol that I've just described into the electronic health record so that when the physician sees this patient with a head injury, a child, it immediately flashes into the electronic record. Have you asked the parents? Have you done a complete physical? Have you identified any neurological deficiencies? So, so this protocol uh, really helps uh, lower the cost of care, but improves the outcomes also. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, this area uh, relates to uh, continuous improvement. Taking this data, and integrating it into a, a continuous improvement program that it should exist at One Care, which does exist. And it, it's again, applying these best practices um, like areas like post-acute care, you know, uh, care to patients, emergency department visits per thousand, and then measuring the return on investment if we make these changes. Uh, I, I feel very assured that the return on investment, if if one care adopted this, this, these principles would be tremendous in the millions of dollars. Third, to have the ability to drill down to look at specific physicians, groups, uh, HSAs, uh, regions, so that you can identify how we're doing in different parts of the state and how different practices are doing in adopting these principles. And, and then lastly, integrate these concepts into the dynamic planning process that should be in place uh, for the organization. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, I mentioned earlier that quarterly uh, reporting would be a key requirement. That again, to make this data driven, that each quarter uh, one care would report how they're doing against targets in these five key areas that I mentioned earlier for benchmarking. Now, this comes with some cost. I, I recognize this. The cost to buy one of these systems is about less than $90,000 per year. Sounds like a lot of money, but when you're spending over a billion dollars for care and some of it is not very efficiently delivered, you, you can save a tremendous return on investment. And I, I believe you'll get at least an eight to one return on investment if, if, the board of one care, if the leadership of one care, and if the providers in one care all commit to these concepts of adopting best practices. Again, it's not ethereal, it's pragmatic. It's where have places implemented uh, th these actions? And it really does work. It's It's got a 10 year history of adopting best practices and, and identifying top performers where are those places that are doing this? What are they doing differently? And adopting these same principles. They're not, they're not actions that are going to hurt people or they're not orga organizationally going to hurt One Care. And then One Care has got to track these. What kind of return on investment are we getting from this less than $90,000 investment? Again, I'm willing to believe that it's significant, likely in the millions of dollars. And then utilize these savings, utilize the savings that are going to occur to lower the rate of increase in costs and to re use the savings to reinvest in other areas within the organization. If we can go to the next slide. The, 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 this fourth area is risk mitigation 
and identification. As I've mentioned, identify the top three to five risk areas. This year, for example, two that come to mind and in, in, uh, throughout the country with ACOs, one is uh, this spike that's occurring in COVID. What impact is that gonna have uh, on 2022, uh, the winter spike this year? Uh, and then second, we're seeing healthcare uh, providers leave the healthcare field at record rates right now. Nursing turnover is as high as I've ever seen it. We're seeing uh, physicians retiring, and, and the reasons vary, but many of them are frustrated with the volume of COVID patients, especially those who are not vaccinated. And these are healthcare providers who are committed to, uh, to caring for people, and so they feel frustrated. So we're seeing a, a dramatic drop in the number of healthcare professionals. And so we've got to come up with alternatives to address this. There, there are ways to do it. Team-based nursing is a great example of contingency planning uh, for organizations. If we can go to the last slide, I'd appreciate it. Um, and, and the last slide deals with these 30 recommendations in five categories that, that I've developed for one care. And these are very specific recommendations. I'm going to highlight just a few quickly because I know we're about at the end of my time, but I, I did want to share a couple with you. The first is in the governance and management area, and, and that is taking this data and integrating it into the strategic planning process, including uh, using it as a part of the program evaluation process each year. Uh, programs ought to be evaluated using data, again, using the data from the benchmarking program integrating it and prioritizing the opportunities within the strategic plan. Uh, second would be board composition. I, a second recommendation is take a look at the board composition of the most successful ACOs in the country, and you'll find certain attributes. One is it, it's competency-based board members. That, that means identifying the skills you need on a board, like a nurse, somebody with nursing knowledge, somebody with IT knowledge, somebody with payer knowledge, and recruiting those kinds of people onto the board that meet those competencies. Second is the most successful ACOs are primary care driven. And the majority of physicians on boards of successful ACOs are primary care physicians. Third, ensure that the mix of the board members look like the people we're caring for. And that means gender mix, racial mix, and, and those are three areas of governance I would urge one care to take a look at. The second area is provider engagement and network management. There a recommendation would be to develop a multi-year, say a three-year plan to move towards more value-based payment to providers that align value-based care with value-based payment. So the economic incentive is aligned with the care incentive, like the diabetes example I provided earlier. The third area is patient engagement. What are the techniques that are used to get people more involved in their care? Simple things like open, open access scheduling is a, is a great example where you can schedule your own appointments across the internet is just one example. Uh, the fourth area is population health management, and there I've, I've described in detail clinical appropriateness tools that can be used. Uh, some of them are free, publicly available. Uh, some you, you you could buy later on, but just you know, crawl, walk, run when it comes to clinical appropriateness. Start with those that are in the CMS Care Compare program, and then lastly, data management. Using data to really improve integrating data into the, uh, the processes that are utilized, uh, and then also developing an annual population health information technology plan that helps you move and prioritize where the data should be gathered, what your priority should be, uh, and then set up a, a priority setting mechanism for population health information technology. So to summarize today, you, you know, and again, this full preliminary report is posted on the website so you you can read it in detail uh, and i hope you will um, this is a great opportunity for one care in my opinion to be a national leader as an aco uh, they have so many uh, 
things that are aligned right now, you know, being in a unique position that they are, uh, I hope they'll take advantage of these opportunities and move to this data-driven approach to managing and to leading. And, and I hope they'll take a, a data-driven approach to transitioning healthcare in this country. Um, it's an exciting opportunity. Change is not easy. Even my, uh, the, 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 the author Machiavelli, uh, he, he said, even the people who will benefit by change will resist change because <clears throat> people use all kinds of reasons and rationale. You know, it's, we want local control. You know, is, does local control supersede using evidence-based care models? That's a question that needs to be addressed because sometimes people are doing things at the local level that aren't consistent with evidence-based care. And I think we owe it to the people we care for to deliver evidence-based care. So uh, to conclude today, I, I think, again, you've got a great opportunity. I'm honored to participate and I hope that I can help move the needle a little bit further towards being one of the best ACOs in the country. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it, Marissa. Thank you so, thank much, you so Joe. much, Joe. Uh, let's see, we might need to turn off a, someone needs to turn off their microphone. Getting an echo. Um, so just a note, as Joe said, his memo is posted on the ACO oversight page. Um, we can also put a link to that in the board meeting materials, but it's not currently with the board meeting materials. Um, so we can get it in both places to ensure that people can see it and um, read. I'm going to bring this together um, by presenting to you the recommendations that the staff have developed based on Joe's recommendations. Um, so we took a look at... Um, Joe's recommendations, which are divided into those two categories, um, which are regulatory levers. And then he developed a set of recommendations that um, the ACO could use um, or reference also that the board could use to evaluate um, the ACO. Um, but we have developed two regulatory uh, levers or sorry, re regulatory recommendations based on his uh based on his analysis and his work. So the first one, and these are new, so I'm going to read them out. They replace or enhance our former reporting requirements. Um, so the first is that OneCare Vermont is to purchase and implement a reputable ACO benchmarking system for each payer program, starting with Medicare. Uh, the selected Medicare benchmarking system should provide a payer-specific data set of peer organizations, ACOs, or integrated health systems, against which to assess OneCare's performance, include identification of high-performing peer organizations and identify best practices of high-performing organizations. Uh, OneCare to select Medicare benchmarking system by February 15th, 2022. Uh, the benchmarking system must be approved by the GMCB staff prior to purchase and um, purchased by March 31st. These are um, dates that can be discussed. We're trying to figure out what what operationally can actually work. This is probably the soonest that it could um, possibly be done based on our understanding of how the, the contractors work, but there's multiple issues at play. So don't uh, read too much into the dates um, at this point. Um, the Green Mountain Care Board expects to expand this requirement to Medicaid um, and commercial payer populations in FY23 um, in, and in spring 22 budget um, update or revised budget, One Care should propose options for benchmarking systems for use in Medicaid and commercial payer programs in FY23. Um, and the reason for starting with Medicare that I don't think we explained is that the benchmarking and data is most highly developed for Medicare. Um, so we want to set this up um, in, a, in a pilot sort of way or reporting only sort of way at first um, to test it. Um, and then we have to dig a little deeper to get to the uh, commercial and Medicaid, the proper benchmarking systems for commercial and Medicaid. Obviously, we can talk more about that um, as we discuss this recommendation. You can go to the, the next slide, please, Michelle. Um, and the second one, the second part of the recommendation is that the Green Mountain Care Board will issue updated reporting requirements in the ACO reporting manual pursuant to Green Mountain Care Board Rule 5.501 to implement a data-driven monitoring approach relying on payer-specific national ACO benchmarking system or data sets. One Care Vermont will report on performance and benchmarking results at least quarterly. One Care Vermont will work with GMCB staff to finalize reporting templates 
by uh, potentially June 30th with first quarterly reports. Um, quarter one, 2022 um, due, due in July. And then the second part uh, is that the FY23 ACO budget review guidance for One Care Vermont should reflect this change in approach and introduce performance targets linked to national benchmarks, along with enforcement mechanisms where One Care Vermont does not perform at the levels outlined in the guidance. So the rule does allow the board to set benchmarks um, as part of our review, um, and this would give us the uh, ability to do that for performance. I also want to note here that the intention is for this type of quarterly reporting to replace a lot of the sort of more ad hoc reports that we currently issue um, and, and give it a sort of more standardized high level, high level look. Um, so it is um, intended to, um, to replace and not add to the burden of reporting that we currently have. Um, you can go to the next and final slide, please, um, which is just a reminder of the timeline um, of what's next. We have discussion period um, and we will come back before you as needed and for a vote. Thank you all uh, for your time. That concludes our staff remarks. And I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Marissa. Um, I'm gonna start the board questioning with board member Lunge, Robin. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you all to Joe and all of our staff. Um, that was very thorough and comprehensive presentation. Uh, there's a lot to chew on and to digest. Um, I would not say that I have specific questions, um, but I do have some comments I wanted to throw out um, in terms of what I'm thinking about in terms of uh, the recommendations um, for other board members to reflect on if they would like, um, and also just for the staff to think about uh, for next week. Um, and I'm going to start from the most, I'm going to go backwards um, because of my, uh, my notes. So um, I like the idea of uh, moving to a more data-driven approach. I think that's something that we have been trying to do in this process as it has evolved. Um, so I'm very interested in the recommendation related to uh, the benchmarking systems. I think that will also be very helpful in terms of moving us uh, towards a system um, at the provider level that is um, data-driven. And if there are systems out there that we can piggyback on, that seems more efficient than trying to build our own, which is uh, sort of what I think we've been trying to do. Um, so I, I'm, I'm in favor of that approach and that uh, requirement. Um, in terms of the Medicare Advantage plans, uh, I like the idea um, that OneCare would focus in 2022 on developing scale target programs with um, our local Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, I know that's been a real shift for us to see more activity in this area, um, so it's kind of a uh, a mixed bag, but I will say one of the pros of having a couple of local Medicare Advantage plans um, in terms of healthcare reform is that I, I think we may have more opportunities to work directly with those plans than with some of the national players, like for example, United or uh, some of the other national Medicare Advantage plans that have dominated that Medicare Advantage marketplace in Vermont prior to the Blue Cross and MVP plans entering the market. So I do think this is the time is now to get ahead of that um, so that we can start to think about how that fits into healthcare reform overall. On the population health management programs, uh, I think that as the overall one care budget um, for the organization or the gap budget as uh, Patrick referred to it in the slides shrinks, I think it does bring into, um, uh, it creates a little bit of a, a worry about, so how do we continue to fund the population health investments um, as we move forward in reform? Um, I did, I generally, it's disappointing, I think, to see those numbers go down. 
And it's disappointing to see a movement away from primary uh, to more community prevention efforts. On the other hand, given the Mathematica analysis and um, what we're seeing in the quality areas and the, and the clinical issues, I, I think taking a step back and really doubling down on those clinical priorities makes sense. Um, and to a point that I think Jess has made in prior years, uh, we haven't really seen whether or not something like the Innovation Fund, for example, um, will actually is actually doing its job of creating best practices in state that then can be spread. So uh, most of the reductions in that area are focused on areas, I think, outside of that core clinical prevention. Um, so at least I think it, uh, the proposal that One Care has brought forward is consistent with their overall focus to try and take a step back and really focus on the, the clinical areas that need focus on for quality. Um, and then I think I will end with um, the VBIF. So uh, I think one of the areas that have come, come up um, in the prior presentations around the One Care budget is both the fiscal year 20 settlement as well as uh, some of these shifts uh, in population health investments. And uh, I think Tom will appreciate uh, my thinking about the settlement dollars, which is these are one-time dollars. Um, and so I think under the One Care policy, there's a couple of options where they can distribute those uh, back to the providers, which is the deal that the providers made, um, or reinvest them in uh, the VBIF or other uh, population health investments. Um, the fact that these are one-time dollars that, in my mind at least, seem linked to some of the strange care patterns that happened during the pandemic, um, I would like to see some of those dollars reinvested in uh, the VBIF, and particularly for the VBIF, because uh, it is a program where there can be carry forward from year to year, and so you're not using one-time dollars to invest in a program that is ongoing and which you would then need to cut the following year when you don't have this unusual um, shared savings situation based on strange pandemic-related care patterns. Um, so I'm interested to hear where the staff will land on the VBIF concept. I think that's a good place to focus investment. Um, and uh, it also, I think, is a good place given some of the results that we've been seeing in the quality area and the Mathematica analysis. So that's kind of where I am. Um, overall, uh, there weren't any conditions that I was uh, not in favor of. I think you, the staff did a good job of coming up with um, both our standard conditions um, that we typically have, as well as uh, thinking through kind of key areas of concern this year. Thank you, Robin. Next, I'm going to go to board member Pelham. Tom? Uh, one time money, the bane of my existence. <laughs> Um, I, I want to thank the staff for an incredibly thorough uh, presentation here. There's so much detail that, you know, my head is spinning and I know that I will never absorb it all. But um, since you're there and you have all your um, expertise in certain areas, I, I feel fully, fully protected from my ignorance. Um, the, I guess I'd like to start with, uh, I mean, one question that I, I, I have like one statement and a couple of shock, couple of short questions. Um, the one question I had uh, written down here before the, the session was uh, in the 2022 budget data submitted, can we see the commercial payments are scheduled at 2.9% in FFP as contract revenue? And uh, Marissa answered that question before I got the answer. And she said, no, um, basically that you can't find it. Um, and to me, that is incredibly disappointing. Um, that uh, that we have our largest payer out there. The commercial payer is by any any uh, uh, standard the largest one in Vermont. Um, in the hospital budget process of over three billion dollars in total revenues, uh, commercial payers were 1.6 billion of that, or 54 percent. And um, 
payment reform is one of the three uh, um, uh, core capabilities that OneCare has in their strategic plan. Uh, they say in their narrative that uh, uh, payment reform is the pivotal first step in managing overall growth um, uh, in, in, in healthcare. And so here we are in a situation where we're trying to get married to the commercial folks and they don't seem to want to do it. Um, we go through the hospital budget process and we find that in terms of the of NPR, hospitals only comprise uh, three tenths of 1% of hospital revenue. Um, we saw in the chart, I think it was slide 65, um, that uh, of the imbalance in terms of the public players versus the commercial where the the public players, Medicare, Medicaid, are in the uh, 51, 54% of their payments in, in FPP. And, and I agree, some of that's the kind of uh, uh, loosely structured FPP, but it's still FPP. And the commercial uh, uh, carrier are at 1%. And so there's a, a part of me that says, judge them by their actions. Maybe they don't want to participate. You know, um, I don't know that, but I do think that that we need to come to a, a clear understanding with the commercial carriers whether or not they want to you know, develop a working effective relationship um, or, or decide whether or not the resources that OneCare is spending on, on them um, are, uh, are being well spent. Uh, it just, it just uh, uh, they're, they're too big a, big a piece of the pie um, to be, have year after year after year um, not have developed a uh, meaningful substantive relationship with them as we have with Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid is uh, full FPP. They have a cost shift problem that I think we need to address, but they're, they're in the and into payment reform and hopefully our efforts with Medicare, you know, over the next year, year and a half will, will bear substantial fruit. And maybe that's where we should be focusing our energy on in the areas where where the, the relationship um, is 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 collegial and um, and forward looking. My two questions are: the first one uh, was, did we get any answer back from uh, One Care about their participation in the benchmark plan review? Um, to me, this just seems a, a one-time opera, uh, opportunity, Robin, the benchmark plan, a one-time opportunity to take a look at the benefits offered by um, Vermont's benchmark plan, which was crafted in 2013, predating all of this effort, and make sure that it is as, as well aligned with um, our, our goals for population health improvement. Um, and and not let this go by, and even and even making sure that it's in line with our goals for popu health, population health improvement before discussions, because it's going to come to us at the board at some point in, in time. We start talking about adding benefits to 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 add to the burden of healthcare costs. Let's make sure that that plan is is very well um, structured. Um, relative, relative, relative population health. And I know maybe it's the only thing we'll find when, when we look at it or one care would find that it should do a pre-diabetes a pre program, which we don't have in our benchmark plan. But my guess is that there is some more there. We'll probably find some high cost benefits with low cost, you know, uh, high cost benefits of low value. Uh, so um, that to me is an opportunity and it's right before us now. It's not going to be here next year. And I think one care, one care needs to take their talents and get engaged. Um, and my final question had to do with, um, as I was at the beginning of the presentation with the, um, uh, the, the cost of care trend developments. And I think it's a, 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 a appendix 4.3. Um, it's the, uh, I would like just some explanation of these basic experience adjustments because those are, they start with the 2021 um, per member per month benchmarks, and then they uh, insert these base experience adjustments. And I wouldn't mind if they weren't significant, but they end up substantially changing, you know, the base for the 20, for, for the, for the 2022 calculation. 
uh, for Medicaid uh, traditional, it was a 6.3% increase. And for uh, Medicaid, um, uh, uh, the, the expanded med Medicaid, it was a 14.7% increase. And I, so those are big numbers. And I'd just like to know kind of what, what comprises a base um, experience adjustment. Um, so that's it. Uh, again, I want to applaud you all for uh, for this, and uh, uh, and uh, I agree with Robin. Robin, in terms of her one-time uh, use of uh, of funds, um, rarely do I get the chance to do that. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, thanks, Tom. I can take those questions. I think they're both on my sections. Um, the first one regarding the benchmark plan, we have not received any additional information or response from OneCare on that beyond what they stated um, in at the hearing, um, which I pulled up real quick. Um, that you know, Tom Borey stated that they're happy to be a contributor in terms of learning what's more in the plan. Um, he's looked into it bit, a bit and has had some concerns around um, now that they're a 501c3 organization being cautious around anything that looks like lobbying. Um, and so it looks like they've, there's been some thinking about it, but I don't have any more concrete, um, uh, response from them around their engagement with the benchmark plan. Um, and on your second question on the trend rates, I'm going to have to punt that one to next week with Sarah Lindbergh, who's going to, uh, talk about the, these trend developments in more detail. Yeah. Uh, one response, I know what Tom Bohr said at, at the hearing, um, he's were concerned about being a lobbyist as a nonprofit, but I bet you there's a lot of nonprofits that are engaged in this benchmark plan, including the insurers, Blue Cross Blue Shield. So uh, I, I don't, um, unless uh, um, some legal mind tells me I'm wrong, I don't accept that as an answer and, uh, um, and just really think that you know, with all the uh, data and analytics, which is one of OneCare's, you know, uh, founding foundational efforts, they could be a, an important contributor to our benchmark plan, and they should be at the she they should be a, be at the table, in my view. I don't I don't buy the the nonprofit argument. Thank you, Tom. Um, any other comments or questions? If not, I'm going to move to, to uh, board member Holmes. Jessica. Great. Thank you. Um, and again, I want to echo the same huge gratitude um, to the staff and to Joe for all the hard work here. It's clear how much work was put into this analysis and, um, you know, really helpful key takeaways from each section and thoughtful recommendations. So there's a lot to digest. Um, I have a couple of initial reactions and a couple of questions. Um, you know, I think like some of the public comment, um, I'm concerned about the shrinking investment in population health programs. And again, this is not going to be a surprise. Uh, what appears to be few resources devoted to program evaluation and return on investment analysis uh, in the in the budget. I think like the staff, I also worry about the weaker incentives in the network based risk model, coupled with smaller risk corridors, although I recognize that's a COVID adjustment there. Um, and, and less funding for the value-based incentive fund, which Robin and Tom already talked about and we heard from the staff as well. Uh, I, I guess essentially I'm, I'm not sure that the carrots and the sticks are strong enough to incent the delivery reform that we want to see. Um, so, you know, I understand also it's a work in progress and, um, you know, some of, the, some of the suggestions made by Joe, I really appreciate. Nobody's going to be surprised to hear that I really appreciate recommendations around data-driven decision-making, the importance of program evaluation, and the need to ensure that care delivery is appropriate and evidence-based, um, and really using some tools to analyze that. So I've thought a, a bit about this, and I have more to think about as well, but I appreciate the, the, the approach the staff is taking. You know, a key takeaway from me is maybe we don't, we aren't micromanaging line items in the budget, but we are better monitoring ACO performance and outcomes and, and doing, you know, uh, a better job at holding the, the uh, ACO accountable to best practices and national benchmarking standards. I think you know the ACO is more established now; it's more mature, and I think we need to start comparing you know One Care Vermont to high-performing ACOs across the country, and requiring real accountability within the network. 
Um, and so I, I fully endorse that condition requiring OneCare to purchase a Medicare benchmarking system for use in 2022 and to identify benchmarking systems for Medicaid and commercial by March of 2022 with use in 2023. I have a couple of suggestions on the recommendation on, I think it's slide 41. Uh, slide 41 is the recommendation around, around the presentation um, on or before April 30th of 2022. One addition I would like to see to that slide is in that presentation, I'd like to hear about the proposed Medicaid and commercial benchmarks that they, in the slide before it says they have to support and submit rather by uh, the end of March. So I would like to see and hear about what those proposed benchmarks would be in their April presentation. Uh, in addition, in that April presentation, I'd like to see the ACO present a report on the results of the evaluations that they actually are doing as they described in their budget submission. One relates to care coordination and the other relates to variations in care. So in, if you go back to section seven of their ACO budget submission, they outlined how they evaluate the care coordination model. They monitor process metrics in terms of establishment of care teams and care plans, quality assurance monitoring, caseloads and counter tracking, and they do outcomes evaluation, ER utilization, hospital admissions, preventative care, length of stay, et cetera. So I would like to see the results of that evaluation presented in April. I would also like to see the results of their HSA level variations in care analysis presented in April. And in light of it's a it's a revised budget presentation, I guess what I really want to hear is how their revised budget addresses the weaknesses that they identify in their evaluation of the care coordination model and how their revised budget addresses HSA specific variations in care that add unnecessary cost to the system and or compromise quality. I also recall at the hearing that they were uh, pursuing a potential relationship with UVM, the, the academic institution, the university, to explore additional evaluations. So I'd like to hear an update on that as well. So I want to, you know, make sure that in April we're hearing about the evaluations um, that they're doing and how their revised budgets actually incorporate the learnings from those evaluations. Um, like Robin, I'm also interested in the staff's recommendation around the value-based uh, incentive fund and potentially using one-time money to increase that fund. Again, trying to increase those, those in this case, carrots. Um, one question I had around slide 48 was, uh, this was with respect to the benchmark trend rates in the payer contracts. I just wondered if we should include a date when those materials and conditions C2 would be due to the board. There was no date in there. There were some dates in other uh, requirements, so I just was going to throw that out there. Um, this is actually more of a question for Joe. Um, I really appreciated your slides. I think it was 109 and 110. Um, you know, again, these recommendations around benchmarking and comparing one care to high performing ACOs. And I wanted to ask you how we should incorporate the information that we glean from these suggestions, uh, you know, on the ACOs performance evaluation into our hospital budget process. And maybe this is a conversation for a later time, re recognizing that we're in the interest of time here. But, you know, say that there's an HSA that seems to be underperforming on cost or quality or not applying best practices for clinical appropriateness. And this emerges in our in our ACO data driven performance evaluation. How should that be incorporated into our hospital budget process, if at all? So that's kind of a, a, a question. I would love to have the answer to, but maybe not at this moment in time. Um, and then the second question around the next slide was slide, I think 112, one of the um, comments around provider engagement core capability. And I wondered how should OneCare Vermont measure meaningful uh, provider engagement? In my mind, and I think I mentioned this in the hearing, it's not enough to sign a contract. The question is, if you're really engaged, are you reforming your delivery system are you shifting resources towards my, more primary prevention and the social determinants? Are the compensation contracts within that organization reflective of value, not volume? Those are the ways in which I would sort of want to measure true provider engagement. So I wondered if you had suggestions for that. You want to take that, Joe? Um, I think your first question, I think you're right that it, it's going to take a more extensive discussion. And, and I've got some ideas, so maybe we can chat about it later on. Uh, the second question, 
I think your points are all very valid about measuring uh, engagement. There, there are different tools we can use um, the, the, about patient engagement, uh, and, and one of them is this basic satisfaction. You know, we can. There, there's some great CMS uh, satisfaction measures, and the two that I find that that are the most um, glo global, globally helpful. One would would you recommend this provider to other people? Yes or no? And then the second is um, on a scale of one to ten, how would you rate your provider? <laughs> and and th those are two questions that I think, you know, a lot of ACOs are actually attaching um, incentive payments to, and, and that starts at the more global level. And then I think you can work down to the, uh, to the level of detail, um, uh, but probably that take a, gr a greater discussion. That was what I was. That's great, but actually, what I was asking about was provider engagement, well, not, provider, I'm sorry, not I'm patient sorry. engagement. And I really mean true provider engagement in terms of we're we're seeing and witnessing at the provider level a change in delivery, a change in resource allocation, a change in compensation, contracting. So how do we? How does the ACO measure true provider engagement other than just participation? Yes or no? Yeah, I, th I think number one is the fact that. That they have, they really have a very high level of participation. I, I mean, in in contracting, number one, um, and and then number two, th there are some tools you can use, some survey tools, that would get to similar questions that you've identified, and so m maybe talking with one care about helping to helping them to craft a questionnaire for providers that would get to some of those questions might be a a, a next step. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, and I just have one more question for the staff, which was around, this is um, slide 114, um, recommendations for the 2023 ACO budget guidance. I, and again, I think I'm going to kick this over to a future conversation, but I noticed in there, there was a suggestion to incorporate both performance targets linked to national benchmarks and enforcement mechanism. So at some point in the future, I'd love to better understand what types of enforcement staff have in mind. Um, for you know, not meeting national benchmarks, we have we have enforcement mechanisms in the hospital budget process, and I'm curious as to what enforcement mechanisms and thoughts the staff have on what that would look like in an ACO process. But again, I, in the interest of time, I'm just going to throw it out there as something to talk about at a later point. I I, I can make a brief note about that. It's definitely okay. a longer, a bigger conversation, but um, that it would probably come in the form of. Um, of some kind of performance improvement plans or um, uh, corrective action plan or some mechanism like that. So right now we have all these ad hoc reports. Um, like I said, we're going to try to eliminate a lot of those in favor of this uh, more high level reporting. But if we see underperformance in some areas, then we would require additional reporting, performance improvement plans or something like that. But um, we would have to sort of work that out through the, the pilot phase of this. Yeah, hugely helpful. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Jess. I'll just touch on a few points. Um, my colleagues have really hit uh, most of them anyways. So um, I just want to say that um, one of the things that jumps out at me, um, just as it did to Robin, is the decrease in the population health investment. And and that's an area of, of concern to me. Um, I have some optimism in some of the recommendations. And, you know, I think everybody should have a goal that in a few years, um, other ACOs in the country are benchmarking against One Care Vermont because One Care Vermont is leading the way. And so I think there's some true optimism in some of the recommendations. Um, that doesn't mean that I, I'm not a little bit disappointed on some areas and, um, you know, it was easy to um, believe very strongly that we should focus on those three key areas that were pointed out, um, you know, three, four years ago. But at some point, I always believed that we would expand what that focus would be. And I think Joe brought up a, a number of potentials for best practices in a lot of different areas. And this isn't something that has to be um, invented. I mean, there are places like Intermountain Health 
and, and others that uh, have protocols in place that could be copied relatively easy. And so um, for that reason, I kind of um, believe strongly that Tom was really on a very important topic and that one care should be involved in the benchmark discussions, the benchmark plan. And, um, you know, we have to keep in mind that our goal isn't just to do things for the attributed population, it's to do certain things for the entire population of Vermont to create a healthcare system that's um, sustainable in the long term. And I, I do think that at some point in time, we have to start moving to a much broader range of areas where there can be um, significant quality improvements and significant savings. Uh, on that same vein of thought, another concern of mine is the fact that we understood last year why the risk corridors were reduced, but if you're truly going to have providers that are invested in making the type of changes that are necessary, um, I think that risk corridor has to go back to where it was previously. I mean, it's, it's just too small a risk corridor for, I think, somebody to take it totally serious. So um, that's a concern for me. Um, other than that, I, th I think we beat the other uh, things to death. Um, so I, I won't go there, but I, I do want to say that, again, there I do have optimism. That doesn't mean that I have some very big concerns. So with that, I'm going to ask, uh, before I go to the public for comment, if the healthcare advocate has any comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I do. I should always be prepared to have a comment in case uh, in case the, kid, the chair just goes ahead and calls on me. Um, um, thank you. I, I, I uh, will uh, echo that uh, a very complete and detailed uh, analysis, and uh, and I, I would uh, offer a, a thank you back to the to your staff that uh, um, my staff has been working um, in, in a good collaborative relationship. Um, I think, um, well, just a few a few quick comments. I, I, I do work for a not-for-profit and do participate in the uh, EHB work group. Um, and, um, but also to recognize that uh, the EHB work group is considering uh, services like hearing aids, uh, whether adult dental could be offered in the EHB, uh, uh, eyeglasses, et cetera. Um, uh, not, uh, that's a, a very different level of question than, um, than, uh, than the concept of, well, just one, that, that's the kind of questions that are being asked and evaluated. Um, <clears throat> the other comment that I, well, the one other thing I think I'll say is just, a, I want to admit that this is a, a pet peeve. Um, um, I don't consume a tremendous amount of media. Um, but when I do, I can't help but hear um, healthcare organization after healthcare organization advertising to me. And um, it's quite overwhelming, one after another after another um, entities that are regulated by you all. And um, since, and so I, I make this comment in the context of that, uh, feeling a bit overwhelmed by it. Um, the I, I know that One Care has been uh, advised by you and by others to do a better job of telling its story, um, and I don't disagree with that. Um, but um, One Care, our care, better care, um, I don't think accomplishes that. And so um, I I uh, and I don't know how much is being spent. On uh, on such advertising, and I don't know how it compares to um, public health investments or um, data analysis or other things that I think uh, um, would be broadly supported, or I would broadly support. But um, but it is a pet peeve of mine to hear so much money being spent on 
uh, name recognition. Um, that's my comment for the moment, Mr. Chair. Thank you. You should be happy that yesterday was December 7th and we won't have to hear the Medicare Advantage ads all the time. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. With that, I'm going to open it up for public comment. And um, if you could raise your hand through Teams or if you're just on a phone, um, speak up and I'll recognize you. The first hand that I saw raised was Walter Carp Carpenter. So, Walter. Wow, I'm first this time, Kevin. Uh, in the interest of brevity, I'll try to, I have about, I'll try to keep this real short. I have about a thousand questions. Um, first of all, <clears throat> I'm glad I'm not a board member to have to digest all of this. So compliments to them who can do it. Second of all, I'm glad I'm not a staff member to have to put all of this together in the first place. Um, one of the things that I noticed in that I am not a business major, not an economics major, and not a lawyer, I am a patient <clears throat> activist, writer, and liberal arts man, is that all of the words, or most of them used in this like benchmarking, population health, data management, exactly what do those mean? And one of the difficulties with one care on the street level is that nobody knows <clears throat> what all of these mean and what they're talking about, how, what they're trying to suggest. Like the Affordable Care Act, for instance, covered how the Unaffordable Care Act was not affordable for most people as they always have these huge deductives. And so you see a lot of that going on. The second comment is kind of <clears throat> just a, a view from the drone of, you know, overlooking it from the drone view and seeing the whole thing is it makes me wonder, A, why Americans can take such a simple comp thing as providing health care and make it so vastly complex that a NASA engineer couldn't understand it. And how is it that a entity with a $1.36 billion budget is going to improve care and actually cut costs while improving care? And I share the concerns of uh, Kevin Mullen that he just echoed about the population and so on. And I'll stop it there just to keep it short. Thank you, Walter. Is there other public comment? Uh, Julie Wasserman. Yes, thank you, Chairman Mullen. I have a couple comments. Um, with regard to the primary care, <clears throat> primary care accountability pool, wondering if someone could explain the rationale for having the struggling independent primary care physicians bear more risk than the hospital-based primary care practices that are in a much more secure uh, situation. Um, it, it looked from today's pre presentation that the uh, independents are bearing 8% of total risk and the um, hospital-based primary care practices are bearing 7%. What, what slide what, number? What slide number? Um, Slide number 61. So which member of staff presented that slide? Mr. Chair, this is Sarah. Um, I am happy to uh, to attempt a response at that. Uh, okay. And now I'm also trying to find the slide. You know, it's bad when you can't find your own slides because there are so many of them. Um, thank you very much for your question, Julie. So the what we've tried to show here on the slide, uh, and this comes from One Care's response to the round two questions, is that within the primary care uh, accountability pool, the, um, the share of the risk paid into the pool is based on attribution. So we've included the proportion of the HSA attributed through uh, each category. So for example, 
um, in Bennington, 31% of all uh, Bennington uh, attributees uh, were attributed through non-hospital primary care, 69% were attributed through hospital-based primary care. Uh, and and that is that is how it's um, broken out. So if you you know kind of do do the math of the total um, primary care accountability pool amount for each HSA, uh, you'll see that it does link to the attribution numbers that went here were, were um, supplied in their round two questions response. Well, um, it's something that I think the Green Mountain Care Board should take a look at because uh, we do know that <clears throat> our primary care physician workforce is not stable uh, or, or thriving or growing or being strengthened by the ACO. And to ask the independents uh, who have borne uh, uh, a tremendous amount of um, uh, challenges um, to bear more risk than the hospital base, something about that just doesn't, doesn't feel right. So that, that's my comment on um, primary care. And, uh, you know, as Joe mentioned, this, the best ACOs, the strongest ACOs in the country are those with a robust primary care um, involvement. So uh, my other comment, oh, I just wanted, I do want to thank staff for making some distinction between reconciled and unreconciled payments. That's something um, uh, that's a really important piece. Thank you for that. And also thank you for the 2021 scale numbers by payer program. That's also very helpful. So thank you. Um, with regard to the ACO's quality performance, uh, today's presentation made scant mention of the ACO's 2020 dismal performance. Um, the ACO's performance with Medicare Live showed a worsening in half the measures. Uh, it was even worse with Medicaid. Uh, nine out of 10 measures were um, uh, declined from the prior year. Blue Cross Blue Shield sees no difference between ACO and non-ACO lives. And um, as you did know, MVP uh, scored 50 out of 100 points. So uh, th that's a pretty uh, dismal um, picture. And um, I, I want to note it. And um, we, I think, have to take that into consideration. Um, my specific question is, uh, where could we find DIVA's final report on the 2020 results uh, in years past? It comes out in October. And um, I have been unable to find it so far. Sarah or Marissa, yeah. do you know if, um, the DIVA report is on our website? Um, my understanding is that DIVA does not yet have the report. But we, we will double check that with DIVA. And if, so, and if we find something different, we will get back to you. Thank you so much. OK, thank you. Next, I'm going to go to Dale Hackett. Interesting you used the word, word Mathematica. The first handbook of mathematics I bought was Russian translated, and it was actually called the Handbook of Mathematica, and is now a rare book, in fact. Um, I hadn't seen that word since then. So I'm concerned about the population health and not doing more investment in that because I also think of that as also um, coordination of care or that coordination of care is in that process. Um, I'm, there's a lot I could speak to, but what I want to specifically ask is way back when they were talking about the Medicare Advantage plans, what was their take on that? Um, I'd be really curious to know. I mean, they filled my mailbox almost three times with advertisements. I got so sick of it, I called them up and they did this quick analysis to see if I was eligible. And of course I wasn't, I knew I wasn't. And then they wouldn't talk about the plans. So that had me wondering just how much value is there to these plans? Um, they certainly put a heck of a commercial blitz on them. Well, Dale, I think many of us share your concerns about the value of uh, the Medicare Advantage plans, but I don't think that's really the, the topic of discussion today. Okay. Um, in terms of how we're doing, uh, 
I'm disappointed, but I'm not surprised. I I expected that with COVID and the pandemic, I, we've got to go down before we can come back up. I expected it to sort of tear apart the system and really challenge it. So I think it's more important what we do going forward and learn from our mistakes and or whatever you want to call them if they aren't mistakes and just there's better policy out there such as fee for service doesn't necessarily work that's been learned or maybe people still think it does but there's a lot to learn in here a lot to digest and i hope the consumer doesn't get lost in it that we stay focused on the value statements and what actually benefits the consumer. Um, of course, we want the hospitals to survive and stay vibrant as well, because a vibrant hospital can serve a consumer well in terms of those quality statements and value statements. That's the end of my comment. Thanks, Dale. An important point because uh, a vibrant hospital is part of a patient-centric model because the patients need that uh, care available to them. And I, I just want to say that uh, today, the numbers were the worst that we've seen since the start of the pandemic. We, we've we got um, really uh, the, the worst situation in the last two years as far as the availability of care, especially when it comes to um, intensive care, because what we have in the state of Vermont today is a lot of people needing care that's not COVID related, but still needs intensive care. And to think that we have over 30 beds being taken up in ICUs with 90% of the people in those ICUs um, for COVID reasons being not vaccinated, it, it just makes me wonder where the team effort is on making sure that everybody's doing everything that they can to not just protect themselves, because I've heard people say, what difference does it make if I'm vaccinated? Um, it does make a difference because if we're gonna get this thing under control, we need everybody's participation. And um, when you do get sick, you're not just hurting yourself, you're denying actually a bed to someone that may need it for another reason. And for that, I would hope that all Vermonters would start being a little bit safer and start using masks whenever appropriate, especially when going out. And, um, you know, the only way that this is gonna get beaten back is if we all work together. And we have been a leader for the nation and we need to get back to being a leader for the nation if we're going to be successful. Is there any other public comment on the one care budget? If not, is there any old business to come before the Green Mountain Care Board? Is there any new business to come before the Green Mountain Care Board? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Be safe, be healthy. And for those who uh, won't be at our next couple of meetings, have the most joyous of holiday seasons. <laughs>